On a chilly morning in November 1939, Lieutenant Commander George Eastwood Erickson, RNR, sat in a stone-cold, drafty, corrugated iron hut beside the fitting-out dock of Fleming Shipyard on the River Clyde. Erickson was a big man, broad and tough, about 42 or 3, fair hair going grey, blue eyes as level as a foot rule, with wrinkles at the corners, a product of humour, and of twenty years staring at a thousand horizons. At the moment, the wrinkles were complicated by a frown of concentration, a tribute to a problem. On the desk in front of him was a file labeled Job Number 2891, Movable Stores. Through the window and across the dock, right under his competent eye, was a ship. An untidy grey ship, mottled with red lead, noisy with riveting, Dirty with an accumulation of wood shavings, cotton waste, and empty paint drums. The fire and the ship were connected, bound together by the frown on his face. For the ship was his. He was to commission and to command HMS Compass Rose. And at this moment, he did not wholly like the idea. It was a dislike, a doubt, compounded of a lot of things which ordinarily he would have taken in his stride. The trouble had to do with this precise moment of history, the start of a war. Ericsson had been just too young to be closely involved in World War I. Now he was secretly wondering if he were not too old to play a worthwhile part in the second. He had a new job, a new ship, and a new crew. In theory, he was proud of them all. In practice, he was unsure of the ordeal and concerned about his fitness for it. Ericsson had been axed from the Navy in 1927 after ten years' service. He had been on the beach for two hard years, and then spent the next ten with the Far East Line, feeling himself lucky all the time, what with the Depression and Britain's maritime decay, to have a seagoing job at all. It was not a good introduction to responsibility in war. And now here he was, with one of His Majesty's ships of war to commission, a crew of 88 to command, and a hundred things in the realm of naval routine to relearn, quite apart from having a fighting ship to maneuver and to use as a weapon. A fighting ship. He raised his eyes and looked at Compass Rose again. She was a corvette, a new type of escort ship, an experiment designed to meet a desperate situation still over the horizon. She was definitely odd, even making allowances for her present unfinished state. She was 200 feet long, broad, chunky, and graceless, designed purely for anti-submarine work, and not much more than a floating platform for depth charges. She was the prototype of a class of ship which could be produced quickly and cheaply in the future, to meet the urgent demands of convoy escort. Her mast, contrary to naval practice, was planted right in front of the bridge, and a squat funnel behind it. She had a high forecastle armed with a single four-inch gun. The depth charge rails aft led over a whaler-type stern, aesthetically deplorable, but effective enough at sea. Ericsson knew ships, and he could guess how this one was going to behave. She would be hot in summer, there was no forced draft ventilation, and no refrigerator. And cold, wet, and uncomfortable at most other times. She would be a natural bastard in any kind of seaway, and in a full Atlantic gale she would be thrown about like a chip of wood. The crew he was less worried about. Both the discipline and the habit of command instilled by the Royal Navy died very hard. All things being equal, he could handle those men, he could make them do what he wanted. The flaw might be in the material he would have to work on. In a rapidly expanding navy, a new ship's company was likely to be a scratch lot. The advance guard of a dozen key ratings had already arrived to take charge in their various departments, gunnery, depth charges, ASDIC, telegraphy, signaling, engine room. As a nucleus, they were satisfactory. But the numbers might be made up by anything from professional hard cases just out of detention barracks to green, 
hostilities only ratings fresh from the farmyard. And his officers, a first lieutenant and two subs, could make a hash of anything he might want to do with the ship. But whatever his doubts, they were not to show. That was a cardinal rule. He was a seaman. This was a seaman's job, though it didn't feel like it at the moment. He bent to his desk again, wishing he could develop some sort of a taste for paperwork, wishing also that his first lieutenant, whose work, incidentally, should have included the file in front of him, were a slightly more reassuring character. Lieutenant James Bennett, R-A-N-V-R, the A for Australia, first lieutenant of HMS Compass Rose, strode around the cluttered upper deck as if he owned every rivet of it, with Petty Officer Tallow, the coxswain, following him at a disrespectful distance. Bennett looked tough, and knew it, and liked it. Everything about him, the red face, the stocky figure, the cap worn at an unusual angle, all proclaimed the homespun sailorman with no frills and no nonsense. That was the picture he had of himself, and with luck it was going to carry him through the war. It had got him his present job, aided by fast talking and a selection board preoccupied with more important things and sifting claims about past exploits. Chance had found him in England at the outbreak of war instead of clerking in a shipping office in Sydney. His commission in the volunteer reserve was undeniable. The rest had been easy. An anti-submarine course, an interview in London, and the job of first lieutenant in Compass Rose. It wasn't all that he wanted. Too much paperwork for a start, though the subs would take care of that as soon as they arrived. But it would do until something better turned up. And meanwhile... He was first lieutenant of this little crap barge, and he was going to act the part. Standing by the four-inch gun, Bennett waited for Tallow to catch up. It took a little time. For Petty Officer Tallow, 17 years in the Navy, three stripes due for a chief PO any moment now, was feeling disgruntled. This certainly wasn't what he had volunteered for. A fiddling little gash boat instead of a proper ship. His last ship had been repulsed. A first lieutenant liked something out of the films, and Christ knows what sort of a ship's company due to join next week. But Tallow, like the captain, was a product of the Navy, which meant, above all, acceptance of the current job and the current circumstances. This man, said Bennett heavily, pointing to the rating who was working on the four-inch gun, is smoking during working hours. Tallow restrained his eye. Uh, yes, sir. Not working proper routine yet, sir. Who says not? I was going to leave it until we had the full ship's company aboard, sir. That makes no difference, said Bennett briskly. No smoking except during stand easy. Understand? Aye, aye, sir. And don't you forget it. This bastard was all wind, thought Tallow. And the only other officers were two green subs. Behind the captain, who was okay, it looked as if he'd have to carry the bloody ship himself. The door of the dockside hut flapped open, letting in a ferocious draught. The captain looked up. Come in, he said, and shut the door very firmly. The two young men who stood before him were, physically, in strong contrast with each other, though their uniforms, with a single thin, wavy stripe on the arm, gave them a surface similarity. One of them, the elder one, was tall, black-haired, thin-faced. He had a watchful air, as though feeling his way in a situation which only needed a little time to fall into its proper category. The other one was a simpler edition altogether, short, fair, immature. A very young man in a proud uniform, and not yet sure that he deserved the distinction. Erickson waited for one of them to speak, knowing well which of them it would be. The elder one saluted and said, Reporting for Compass Rosa. He proffered a slip of paper, and Erickson glanced at it. Your Lockhart. Yes, sir. And your therapy. Yes, sir. First ship? Yes, sir. Lockhart answered as a natural spokesman. We've just come up from King Alfred. How long were you training there? Five weeks. And now you know it all. Lockhart grinned. No, sir. Oh, that's something, anyway. What was your job in peacetime? 
Journalist, sir, said Lockhart. The captain smiled and waved his hand round the room. What's the connection? I've done a lot of sailing, sir. Mm. He looked at Verabee. What about you? I was uh, working in a bank, sir. Ever been to sea? Only across to France, sir. We might find that useful. All right. Take a look at the ship and report to the first lieutenant. He's somewhere aboard. Where's all your gear? At the hotel, sir. It'll have to stay there for a bit. We won't be sleeping on board for a week or so. He turned back to his desk. The two young men saluted, somewhat uncertainly, and made for the door. As Ferriby opened it, the captain said, By the way, don't salute me indoors when I haven't got a cap on. I can't return it. The proper drill is for you to take your cap off when you come in. Sorry, sir, said Lockhart. It's not vital, said Erickson. They could hear the friendliness in his voice, but you might as well get it right. When they had gone, he paused for a moment before returning to work. Journalist, bank clerk, trips to France, sailing. They didn't sound very professional, but they seemed willing. And the older one, Lockhart, had some common sense by the look of him. You could do a lot with common sense at sea, and you could do precious little without it. Therabee had been married only six weeks. Saying goodbye to his wife two nights previously, he had confided once more his uncertainty, his doubt about what he had taken on. But darling, she had said with that loving smile which he found so moving, you can do anything. You know you can. Look how happy you've made me. It was illogical, but it was very comforting all the same. Everything about their marriage was like that. Ferriby had said goodbye to a new wife. Lockhart had said goodbye to nothing. He had answered journalist to the captain, but he was not at all sure he deserved the title. He was 27. For six years, he'd scratched a living in and around Fleet Street. It had taught him a lot but it had not given him an ounce of security or a moment's freedom from worry. He had joined up because it was a war. He had joined the Navy because he knew about ships, small ships anyway, and could navigate. Now he felt happy and free and confident. He liked the change. They crossed the rough plank that served as a gangway and jumped down onto the deck. Here and there it was still rhymed with frost and a hundred things were lying about. Oil drums, toolboxes, welding gear, oddments of equipment. Lockhart led the way aft and they went below and presently found themselves in the cabin space. There were only two cabins. One with a single berth labelled First Lieutenant and a tiny wardroom. The whole thing was cramped and full of awkward corners. This is going to be damn crowded, said Lockhart. You and I share a cabin, I suppose. I wonder what the first lieutenant's like, said Ferriby, looking at the label on the door. Whatever he's like, we'll have to put up with him. He can make or break this ship as far as we're concerned. A raucous voice over their heads shouted, Below! The noise rang round the empty wardroom. What a rough man, said Ferriby. Lockhart walked to the foot of the ladder and peered upwards. Yes? The red face framed in the companionway was not reassuring. Bennett was glaring down at him. What the hell are you hiding down there for? I'm not, said Lockhart. Won't you tell the report to me? After looking round the ship, yes. Sir, prompted Bennett unpleasantly. Sir, said Lockhart. You could almost feel Ferriby's harassed expression behind him. Is the other sub down there too? Yes, sir. We didn't know you were aboard. Don't wear a green coat with me, said Bennett obscurely. Come up here and double up. Confronting the two of them at the top of the ladder, Bennett looked at them closely. It's your job to find out where I am, he began sourly. Names? Lockhart, said Lockhart. Ferriby, said Ferriby. How long since you were commissioned? A week, said Lockhart, and added, the temporary probationary. I can see that said Bennett disagreeably. Ever been to sea before? In small boats, said Lockhart. I don't mean pissing about in yachts. Then, no. Bennett turned to Ferriby. You? 
No, sir. Wonderful. Well, we'd better find out what you can do. Have you been round the ship? Yes. How many firehouse points are there? Fourteen, answered Lockhart promptly. He had no idea what the right answer was, but he was quite sure that Bennett didn't know either. Very clever, said Bennett. He turned to Ferriby. What sort of gun have we got? A four inch, said Ferriby after a pause. Four inch what? asked Bennett roughly. Breach loading, quick firing, Mark four, Mark six, fixed ammunition? I don't know, said Ferriby miserably. Find out, snapped Bennett. I'll ask you next time I see you. Now both of you go back to the hut and start checking stores. Yes, sir, said Lockhart. He turned to go, as did Ferriby. Salute, said Bennett. They saluted. I'm the first lieutenant round here. Don't you forget it. In a public house in Argyle Street, Petty Officer Tallow and the Senior Engine Room Rating Chief E.R.A. Watts were drinking up before going off to their lodgings. They had drunk seven pints of beer apiece. It had not made an atom of difference either to their diction or their bearing. They were there partly because there was nothing else for them to do and partly because they liked the place and could not have felt more at home anywhere. They had been grumbling as well as drinking since eight o'clock and had mellowed very little in the process. She'll not be a happy ship, I can tell you straight. Watts was a grey-haired Scotsman, nearly through with his time in the Navy. There's not the makings of it. I'm not saying the skipper's not okay, but that Jimmy's a bastard. He was round my engine room tonight, blithering about a watch-keeping bill. And me with the bloody main shaft still opened up. Sooner I get my ticket and settle down on the pension, the better. There'll be no ticket while the war lasts, said Tallow. If you're warm, you're in for the duration. Well, there'll be sure billets, insisted Watts. Something easy back in barracks that will just suit me. The ship's too small for my liking. She'll be lively enough, agreed Tallow. By God, you could hoist the whole outfit aboard Repulse and not feel the difference. Watts laughed. I hope young Repulse will be handy if we run into trouble. We're likely to do that by the way they're talking. Beats me how they can expect ships of that size to put up any sort of protection for the convoy. What have we got in the way of armament? One bloody little four-inch pop gun and a row, couple of rows of depth charges. They'll make rings round us. What gives me is the accommodation, broke in Watts. But all mixed up together and there's not enough room anyway. The folks was about six feet by four. There's no canteen, no refrigeration, no forced draught. Whoever designed that ship must have been blind drunk. Wish the bastard had to sail in her. Morosely, Tallow took a final swig at his tankard and then looked across at the bar as time was called. What about it? On for the road? Not for me. I've got to work tomorrow. Outside, Argyle Street was noisy with people coming out of the pubs and stumbling about in the blackout. At the street corner, a raw wind made them turn up their coat collars and put their hands deep in their pockets. As they made their way to their tram stop, Heaven help sealers, said Watts piously. Man, it'll be bitter at sea tonight. We'll know that soon enough said Tallow. A couple of weeks from now, we'll be crying our eyes out for Argyle Street. Wet or fine, you just wait. Lockhart and Ferriby were both tired. They had spent most of the day in the dockyard hut checking lists of stores and charts with periodic, maddening directives from Bennett to break off and do something quite different. Now, after late dinner, they were both lying in bed in the hotel room they shared on Socky Hall Street. Therabee staring at the ceiling, hands clasped behind his head, Lockhart smoking and thumbing through the manual of seamanship. Presently, Therabee stirred, and leaning over on one elbow, asked, I wonder if I could get my wife up here. Good idea. We won't be living on board for some time. Why not ask about it? Ask who? Bennett, I suppose, or the captain. Bennett would say no. I was just getting used to being married. It must be very satisfactory, said Lockhart, without irony. It's more than that. 
It's meant everything to me the last few weeks. I don't know how I could have got through otherwise. Well, there's no harm in asking. Try it and see what happens. Lockhart switched out the light and lay back. Oh, God. Why do we have to get up so early? There's a terrific lot to do, said Ferriby. Yes, I suppose so. Good night. Good night. Don't let it get you down. It's all so different from what I expected, said Ferriby. Wife, said Bennett. Didn't know you had one. How long have you been married? Six weeks, said Ferriby. Bennett smirked. Tom, you gave it a rest then. He affected to consider the matter, frowning down at his desk. Then he shook his head. No, sub, he said. I don't like the idea. There's too much work to do. You gotta concentrate. What's the good of you slipping off for a honeymoon every time the bell strikes? It'll take your mind off the ship. Ferriby swallowed. He hated the conversation, but he persisted bravely. All I want to do, he began again, I know bloody well what you want to do. The crude leer on Bennett's face was sufficient commentary, but he clinched it more crudely still. You've quite enough to do without sleeping ashore every other night and coming back clapped out. You'd better forget it. It was something which Ferriby did not forget. When he told Lockhart about it, he was pitifully distressed. I don't mind so much having it turned down, he said, but to talk about it like that, it's beastly. Lockhart shook his head. You might have guessed it. He's that sort of man. I hate him. Lockhart tried to steer him away from the emotional aspect. You know, he said, I don't believe it's even necessary for you to get permission for this sort of thing. They can't possibly stop your wife coming up here. Ask the captain about it. But even if she were here, Bennett could stop me going to Glasgow to see her. Not on your days off duty. Well, I bet he could. Lockhart nodded. Yes. I bet he could, too. He'd find some way, especially if you ask the captain after being refused permission. He smiled at Ferriby across the wardroom table. Better forget it, as that bastard said. There'll be other chances later. It sometimes seemed to Ericsson that there would never be any end to the new problems and questions which cropped up every day. He had to handle them all himself. The two subs were willing enough, but green as grass, and Bennett, he found, had less experience than his manner led one to expect, as well as a great deal less energy. Gradually, however, there came to be less noise on board, less space cluttered up with tools and dockyard equipment, less untidiness, less oil and dirt. The workmen thinned out, until only a thin trickle of them mounted the gangway every morning. Stores were stowed, cabins carpeted, the mestics fitted with their cots and lockers. Compass Rose took on, at last, the shape and feeling of a ship. It was time to transfer aboard her, and they were all glad to do it. When the main draft of the crew, sixty-odd men, arrived from Devonport Barracks, they lost little time in echoing Petty Officer Tallow's strictures on their accommodation. The mestics were small and intolerably crowded. The hands were all lumped together, seamen, stokers, signalmen, telegraphists. They had to take their meals in the sleeping spaces and read or write letters with other men jammed up against them on either side. And if it was like this in harbour, what was it going to be like at sea, with a ship rolling her guts out and everything wet through as well? Two days before Christmas, the captain went up to Glasgow for a final visit to headquarters. He returned with a fresh sheaf of papers which he studied for some time in his cabin. Then he went down to the wardroom where the others were assembled. Sailing orders, he said briefly as he sat down. We go down river the day after tomorrow, and in case you've forgotten, the date will be December the 25th. A nice present, said Lockhart in the pause that followed. I hope so. Here's a rough program, anyway. We'll be towed down to the oiling berth about five miles down river. We'll oil there and then steam the rest of the way down to Greenock. There we stay at anchor for about a fortnight, taking on stores and ammunition and adjusting compasses. Then we go out on our full power trials, probably down to Ailsa Craig and back. We'll test the guns and the depth charge gear on the way. That takes us to January 12th. And then, if everything's all right, we go north to Ardnett Crèche for our working-up exercises. 
How long will I take, sir? Asked Bennett. The program says three weeks. It won't be less, and if we don't put up a good show, they can keep us there as long as they like. So it's up to us. Do you hear that, subs? Interjected Bennett unnecessarily. We don't want any mistakes from either of you. Erickson frowned slightly. We don't want any mistakes from anyone, whether it's me or a second-class stoker. It was the first time the captain had been heard to correct anything Bennett said. Lockhart found himself wondering if it had happened before, in private, and whether the captain were actually as blind to the situation in the wardroom and elsewhere as he seemed to be. If he really had a critical eye on Bennett, then there was hope for the future. Well, there it is, Erickson continued. We have to be ready to move in 48 hours. He raised his voice and called, Andrew! Leading Stuart Carslake, who had been listening attentively outside, waited a decent interval before appearing in the doorway. Yes, sir? Gin, please, and whatever anyone else wants. And later, over the second round of drinks, he said, I think we'd better have a wardroom party tomorrow night. We may not get another chance for some time. It was not particularly impressive, that first tow-down river to the oiler, save for one odd accompaniment to it which Ericsson, like many other people on board, found moving. As Compass Rose edged outwards from the quay and gathered way with a tug at either end, Petty Officer Tallow at the wheel and Lockhart with his forecastle party neatly fallen in by the windlass, a small cheer broke out from the knot of dockyard workers lining the quayside. It was ragged, it was uncoordinated and unrehearsed. It was all the more impressive for this rough spontaneity. Other men from other yards left their work to wave to Compass Rose as she passed down river. Men who had built ships were building them now, and would build countless others, pausing in their jobs to speed on her way the latest product of the Clyde. The moment of farewell was not prolonged. It was too cold to stand about, and the dusting of snow that overlay the quays and docks and birthing ships lining the river was a sharp reminder of the wintry day. But the gesture, repeated many times on their way towards the open sea, remained in the memory, the last message from the fraternity of men who built the ship to the sailors who would live and work and fight aboard her. Five hours later, Compass Rose, under her own power, left the last narrow section of the river and nosed her way downstream towards the tail of the bank, the naval anchorage off Greenock. The early winter dusk was beginning to close in, hiding the far reaches of one of the loveliest harbours in Britain. The line of hills surrounding it turned from purple to black shadow. The lit boys and the shore lights came up blinking to challenge the twilight. It was now very cold though the wind had died earlier that afternoon. Their berth had been signaled to them and identified on the chart. They still had a few hundred yards to go before they dropped anchor, and the captain, with leisure to look about him, was studying the other ships which crowded the broad sweep of the Clyde estuary. There were many of them, a battleship, a smart new cruiser, half a dozen destroyers, an aircraft carrier, scores of minesweepers, Beyond them, in the merchant ship anchorage, was line upon line of ships collecting for a convoy, dominated by two huge liners in the grey wartime dress of troop ships. At the back of the bridge, Ericsson could hear leading seaman Wells giving a running commentary on the ships in company, a commentary which revealed, as nothing else could, the sense of family which informs the Royal Navy. The battleship's the Royal Sovereign. We were at jib with her last spring cruise. There's the old Argus, one of the first carriers ever built. That must be the sixth destroyer flotilla. I wonder what they're doing here. This one of the new town-class cruisers. Didn't know they were in commission yet. The pilot, a bluff Clydesider, said suddenly, Just coming in on my bearing low, Captain. And Erickson returned to the business of anchoring. The telegraph clang for stop engines, and then for slow astern, he called out, Stand by, to Lockhart on the forecastle. And a minute later, as the ship gathered gentle sternway, his shout of, Let go, was answered by the thunderous roar of the cable running out. Compass Rose lay at anchor, her first journey accomplished. 
The time, he was pleased to note, was three minutes past four. The dividing dusk was now upon them, and the air had a bitter edge to it. But the ring of shore lights and the scores of craft in company seemed to be bidding him and his ship welcome. They went out on their gun trials at the end of their first week at Greenock. The trials were simple enough. They fired a few rounds from the four-inch gun on the forecastle and tested the two-pounder aft and the light machine guns on the bridge, which completed an armament modest enough by any standard. God help us if we run into the Sharnost, said an imaginative seaman. But among the gun's crews which he had been working up in harbour, and especially in a leading seaman called Phillips, who was the gunner's mate, the rating responsible for the cleanliness of the guns and the storage of ammunition, Lockhart was aware of an encouraging interest. Most of these guns' crews were amateurs, of course, the hostilities-only ratings who survived the derision of the regulars to become a huge majority in the Navy. But they learned fast, and here and there an obvious instance of intelligence and enthusiasm marked one of them down for a higher rating as soon as the necessary training had been completed. Phillips, who was also in charge of the forecastle party, was big and slow-moving, a two-badge leading seaman with considerable influence in the mess decks. And it was he who, during the gun testing, had made a remark which caught Lockhart's attention. The loading number, the man responsible for ramming the shell home, had missed his swing and left the shell half in and half out of the breach. The whole rhythm of firing was lost, and it was 30 seconds or so before the shell could be extracted and put in again properly. Phillips, who was number one on the gun, turned round from his sights and said ironically, If you do that in action, my lad, and they land a couple of 14-inch bricks while we're fiddling about clearing the gun, I'll never forgive you. Lockhart enjoyed the studied understatement. Obviously, Phillips was beginning to think ahead, to the time when Compass Rose would be fighting instead of practicing. He had seen, behind a piece of carelessness which was merely annoying, a mistake which might be fatal. And it was an encouraging symptom of a kind of interest which would pay a rich dividend in terms of efficiency and effectiveness later on. There were 14 days at Greenock, some of them spent at anchor, ammunitioning and storing and doing harbour exercises. Others devoted to their sea trials and the preliminary gunnery and depth charge tests designed to prove their weapons. Their eyes were now turning inwards, towards the ship and their task in her. It was astonishing how Compass Rose was already coming alive as a ship, a separate unit with a developing personality. The process of eighty-odd men shaking down together was well advanced, and now it was moving towards the next stage, the welding together of these men into a working crew, the tuning up for action. They were beginning to concentrate, beginning to feel that they and the ship had work to do, and that it was worth doing. It was being helped from outside by the first convoy reports and rumours and by the landing of merchant navy survivors at nearby Gorok, from which it was clear that there must have been a number of U-boats already at sea, in full operational trim on the day that war was declared. This, then, was going to be Compass Rose's battle. It really existed. It was worth taking on. It had to be won, and the sooner they were ready for it, the better. On the day when Compass Rose turned homewards after her final trials, and began the smooth run up the sheltered Firth of Clyde, Ericsson was conscious only of an exhilarating satisfaction. The ship went forward at an easy ten knots, with the flood tide adding a couple more. The winter sunset, a lovely red and orange, made the bracken on the surrounding hillsides glow like fire. Ericsson found it hard to exclude from his voice as he gave the helm orders that would lay a course through the defence boom the eagerness that possessed him. For Compass Rose was clear. Her engines and her armament were all in order. In a few days they would go north to Ardna Kresh for their final working up, and then she would be ready. Vice Admiral Sir Vincent Murray Forbes sat at his desk in the operations building overlooking the harbour at Ardna Kresh. He was writing a report. 
It was one of hundreds of reports on ships and men which he was to write, month in and month out, until the end of the war. On ships destined to be sunk or to survive, on men marked for killing or for honour at the king's own hands. He didn't know what lay in store for these ships or these men. He was concerned only with facts. HMS Compass Rose, he wrote, completed her programme of training on February 2nd, 1940, and may be regarded as having passed out satisfactorily. The ship has been well worked up and is clean and generally efficient. Further attention should be given to firefighting and to the drill for abandoned ship, but with these reservations, the organisation now meets the high standard necessary to a ship engaged in the exacting task of convoy escort. Gunnery, he wrote as a subheading and underlined it. The single four-inch gun, which is the sole major armament of this class of ship, will only be adequate if constant attention is given to gun drill and to ammunition supply. HMS Compass Rose did well in her various gun trials, but anti-aircraft shooting conducted with a towed steamer target was less successful. It is recommended that more provision be made for anti-aircraft gun control, probably by loudspeaker operated from the bridge. Asdix, he went on, and underlined again. On her arrival, HMS Compass Rose was inadequately trained in this branch, and the anti-submarine control officer and the Asdix ratings were clearly in need of intensive practice. When this had been provided, her efficiency improved rapidly, and she developed an effective anti-submarine team. Depth charge organization, he wrote. Only constant practice will bring the depth charge crews up to the high standard of efficiency necessary in this branch. Time tests of reloading and firing were generally disappointing, and it is emphasized that speed and accuracy may be vital here when the ship is in action. Reports on officers. Lieutenant Commander George Eastwood Erickson, RNR, commanding officer. This officer exhibited a high standard of seamanship and showed himself expert at ship handling. I judge him to be a conscientious and determined officer who, when he has gained more experience in this new class of ship, will extract everything possible out of his command. His relations with his subordinate officers appeared satisfactory, and it was clear that he inspired their confidence. Lieutenant James Bennett, R-A-N-V-R, First Lieutenant and Anti-Submarine Control Officer. This officer has a remarkable self-confidence, and with more experience and application, his executive capacity may come to match it. He tends to rely too much on his junior officers implementing his orders. In the initial stages, there were serious flaws in the internal organization of HMS Compass Rose due to this officer's inexperience. A downright, forceful personality who should make a good first lieutenant when he learns to set an example of self-discipline. Sub-Lieutenant Keith Lang Lockhart, RNVR, Gunnery and Navigation Officer. I was impressed by this officer's competence, in novel surroundings and in a position of responsibility when backed by very little practical experience. His gun crews were well worked up and he seemed to inspire confidence in the ratings in his division. He should develop into a good type of officer, very useful in a ship of this class. He should pay more attention to the regulations governing dress for officers when on duty. Sub-Lieutenant Gordon Percival Dewis Therabee, RNVR, Depth Charge Control and Correspondence Officer. This officer lacks both experience and self-confidence and appeared hesitant in giving orders. There is no reason why he should not develop into a useful officer, but he must learn to trust his own judgment and to give the ratings under his charge the impression that he knows what he wants from them. The Admiral drew a thick line under his report and blotted it neatly. Then he added at the bottom, Addressed, Commander-in-Chief Western Approaches, copies to Flag Officer in Charge, Glasgow, Admiral TCW Branch, HMS Compass Rose. Then he sat back and rang for his secretary. 
Erickson, at ease in his cabin, read his copy of this report with satisfaction and a good deal of amusement. The Admiral had come well up to standard by way of farewell. It was a perfect picture of number one, despite the limits of official phraseology, and he liked especially the crack about Lockhart and dress regulations. Lockhart having mislaid his cap on one crucial occasion and greeted the Admiral with something between a wave and a bow. Then, as he folded the sheets of paper again, there was a knock on the door, and leading signalman Wells came in, a sealed envelope in his hand. A secret signal, sir? said Wells, in not quite his normal, inexpressive voice. The signal boat has just brought it aboard. Erickson ripped open the envelope and read slowly and carefully. It was what he had been waiting for. Being in all respects ready for sea, said the pink slip, HMS Compass Rose will sail to join convoy AK-14, leaving Liverpool, bar light vessel, at 1200A, 6th February 1940. Senior officer of escort is in HMS Viperous. Acknowledge. Erickson read it through again. Then, take this down, he said. To Commander-in-Chief Weston approaches from Compass Rose. Your 0939 stroke 4 stroke 2 acknowledged. And send it off straight away. So, they went to war. The war to which they went had hardly settled down, even in broad outline, to any recognizable pattern. The liner Athenia had been torpedoed and sunk with the loss of 128 lives on September the 3rd, the first day of the war. The first U-boat sinking to offset this ruthless stroke was on September the 14th. Thus, at the beginning, the pace was hot. Forty ships were sunk during that first September, and two fine warships, Courageous and Royal Oak, both went to the bottom before the turn of the year. But the pace did not last. The casualties had been mostly independent ships which happened to be at sea when war was declared, but with the growth of the convoy system, this chance ill fortune could be avoided. The U-boats were on the offensive, but it was not a coordinated attack, nor even a very efficient one. Probably there were not more than a dozen of them at sea at any one time during this stage of the war, and so they hunted alone. They hung about off the coast of Scotland and Ireland and in the Bay of Biscay, on the lookout for stray ships which they could pick off at leisure. Such was the battlefield of the Atlantic when 1940 dawned. To this untidy battle, Compass Rose sailed early in the year. The sun was out as they sailed down into Liverpool Bay on that fine February morning to meet their convoy. It had pierced the early mist, melted the frost of their cold night passage, dried out their clothes with a cheerful warmth. Five miles ahead of them, their ships were coming out. They were led by Viperous, an old V&W class destroyer. There were ships of all shapes and sizes, tankers, big freighters, small ships which would surely have been better off in the coasting trade than trying the hazards of an Atlantic passage. Some were deep laden, some were in ballast and uncomfortably high out of the water. They steamed in single file from the narrow Mersey Channel. Their pendants flew bravely in the sunshine. They seemed almost glad to be putting to sea again. That could hardly be true, thought Erickson with a smile, remembering the tearful goodbyes, the hangovers, the feeling of, oh, God, here we go again, which attended every sailing. But there was something about the file of ships, 46 of them, which suggested a willingness to make the voyage, a tough confidence in the future. That first night with the convoy was a restless affair which gave them very little sleep. They were still organized on a two-watch basis, that is, the captain and Ferriby alternated with Bennett and Lockhart, four hours on and four hours off. It was a trying arrangement at the best of times, hard on the endurance and the temper. Even if they could fall asleep, as soon as they came off watch, they had to wake and dress and climb up to the bridge again almost before they'd turned over. But this was not the best of times, and Compass rose far from a restful place when they were off duty. The wind was rising, and the Irish sea with it. The ship responded to the movement with a deplorable readiness. In the noisy turmoil between decks, sleep was barely possible, 
even to men already dog-tired. There were other things, too. An aircraft flying low over the convoy brought them needlessly to action stations at two o'clock in the morning. One of their ships, straggling in the rear, where Compass Rose was stern escort, needed constant chivying to keep her in touch with the main body. Their progress was dishearteningly slow. Altogether, the first night at their appointed job was not reassuring. If it could be as trying as this, with no enemy to fight and only a few odd incidents to contend with, what would it be like when they met the real ordeal? For eight days, they steamed straight into a westerly gale, 500 miles at a grindingly slow pace, buffeting through a weight of wind which seemed to have a personal spite in every blow it dealt. They found hardest to bear the monotony of rolling, with an occasional variant, the shuddering crunch with which Compass Rose greeted a head sea. The rolling affected every single thing they did, on watch or off. Often they had to cling to the bridge rail for hours at a stretch, drenched and cold, while the ship disgraced herself with a tireless 40-degree roll. And then off watch, and supposedly resting, they had to eat their meals with the food continually slopping into their laps, and the wardroom furniture creaking and sliding and occasionally breaking adrift altogether and hurtling across the room. They were always being hurt in spite of a continual watchfulness. Doorways hit them as they were leaving their cabins. They were thrown out of their bunks as soon as sleep relaxed their tense care, and all around them on the floor would be books and papers and boots and clothes, which some especially violent role had released from control. The convoy was dispersed over more than 50 square miles. The escorts were out of touch most of the time. It was impossible to establish any sort of convoy speed because they were no longer a composite body, just a lot of ships making the best they could of the vile Atlantic weather. The big ships in the van slowed down till they had almost lost steerage way and tried to preserve some sort of order, but the smaller ones still straggled away behind, virtually heaving two at the height of the gale and often having to steer many degrees off their true course simply in order not to batter themselves to pieces. On the eighth day, Viperus, which had had a very bad time and had lost two men overboard, signalled, Convoy disperse, proceed independently. In the circumstances, the signal had an irony which they were scarcely in the mood to enjoy. They had a rendezvous with the incoming convoy, and they found it, somehow. It was navigation of a very high order, in the wilderness of wind and rain, with visibility hardly more than 500 yards at any time, they found a single pinpoint in mid-Atlantic, which brought them up with the ships they were waiting for. They turned for home, with a new convoy of 30-odd ships, and now, with the fierce wind behind them, it was more uncomfortable still. Aboard Compass Rose, conditions were indescribable. She rolled furiously, with a tireless malice allowing of no rest for anyone. Cooking was impossible, even had they not exhausted their fresh meat and vegetables many days previously. The staple diet was tea and corned beef at breakfast, lunch and dinner for nearly a fortnight on end. Everything was wet through. Some water had come down a ventilator and flooded the wardroom. Forward, the mess decks were a crowded hell of saturated clothes, spare gear washing about round their feet, food overturned, and all the time the noise, the groaning, slamming violence of a small ship fighting a monstrous sea. There seemed no end to it. The gale did more than scatter the convoy. It kept every single ship in it hove to for two days on end, waiting for the weather to moderate. In those two days, Compass Rose covered 18 miles, sideways and due south. She spent them in company with a small merchant ship which had engine trouble and asked for someone to stay with her. For all of 48 hours, Compass Rose circled very slowly round the derelict, taking three hours to complete each circuit, moving with agonizing slowness against the mountainous seas and rolling, rolling, rolling all the time as if she wanted to tear her mast out. They lost one of their boats, which went clean under a huge wave, and never came up again. They 
lost some oil drums which were stowed aft. When the storm finally blew itself away, they spent another 24 hours hunting for the convoy and reassembling it. But no voyage can last forever. There came an afternoon when the horizon ahead was not level, but uneven. Not the pale grey of the sky, but the darker shadow that was the land. The foothills of Scotland came up suddenly, beckoning them onwards. Their rolling lessened as they came under the lee of the northern coastline. Presently, towards dusk, they were in shelter, and running down towards the home port that promised them rest and peace at last. It was difficult to realise that the worst was over, and that Compass Rose, on a steady keel, could become warm and dry again. So the first convoy ended. It had been a shock, the more so because of the doubt in the background as to how they would fare in action with U-boats, if action were added to so startling an ordeal. But they did not think of this straight away. That night, tied up alongside the oiler after seventeen days of strain, they were all so utterly exhausted that a dead and dreamless sleep was all they were fit for. It seemed that they were to be stationed permanently at Liverpool, and the man it most suited was Tallow. His home was in Birkenhead, just over the river from Gladstone Dock, and he had no false notions as to the relative comforts of Compass Rose and Number 29 Dock Road. It was a home he shared with his widowed sister, Gladys Bell, who had kept house for him ever since her husband died. Whenever he came back on leave, his room was waiting for him, and a cheerful welcome as well. Gladys was forty-ish, plain, good-natured, and she and Tallow got on very well together, in an undemanding sort of way. He had hoped that she would marry again, even though he would lose thereby, but there had never been any sign of it, and by and by the idea ceased to worry him. If a decent widowhood suited her, it suited him. When he went round to the house on their second night in harbour, and walked into the tiny, gas-lit kitchen with a Well, glad, which had been his greeting ever since she could remember. Her plain, sallow face lighted up at the surprise. Bob, where have you sprung from, lad? She had not seen him for six months. Her mind darted immediately to the larder, wondering what she could give him on his first night ashore. Have you had your tea? Tea? He smiled mockingly. If you ever know me, I have my tea on board when I can get your cooking just by crossing the river. There was a hesitant cough behind him in the doorway. Oh, uh, said Tallow awkwardly. Brought a friend, uh, Chief E.R.A. Watts, same ship. Come into the front, she said, when they'd shaken hands and mumbled to each other. This kitchen's not fit to be seen. In the front parlour, she lit the gas, and the overcrowded room sprang to life. How's the new ship? she asked her brother. The two men exchanged glances before Tallow answered. She'll never live to be old. Watts laughed. That's about the size of it. We've had a rare trip, I can tell you. Rough as I've ever known it, said Tallow. Gladys clicked her lips. Well, I never... You must be ready for a bit of a rest. I'm ready for a pint, said Tallow with alacrity. Gladys smiled. Why not walk round to the three tons while I'm getting the tea? Tallow cocked his eye at Watts. What do you say? Watts nodded. Suits me. Half an hour, said Gladys firmly. Not a minute more. Otherwise it'll spoil. What are you going to give us? Never you mind. Later that evening, in the cosy parlour with a big fire going, they all enjoyed themselves. The two men talked of the trip and of other trips, while Gladys sat back and listened to them and threw in an occasional comment. She did not like the sound of Compass Rose, but when she said so, bluntly, they were curiously quick to put in a good word for the ship, to make excuses for this and explain away that. But it was good to have them there, and to know that they were relaxed and happy after the hard times. 
There was one job of Lockhart's, which had been his ever since he had joined Compass Rose, and had admitted, in a moment of inattention, that one of his uncles had once been a surgeon at Guy's Hospital, and that was the job of Ship's doctor. So far, it had involved him in nothing more than treating toothache, removing splinters and so on. He realised that this would not always be so. Other corvettes had had casualties to deal with after ships in convoy had been torpedoed, and sooner or later he himself would be faced with an experience he was little fitted for. It was a thought he shied away from. As soon as they had got in at the end of their first trip, Ericsson had applied for another officer to be appointed to the ship. It was clear that there was far too much work for a first lieutenant and two subs to handle, leaving out of account the chance that accident or illness might make them more short-handed still. He presented a good case, arguing the matter first with a faintly supercilious staff officer who seemed to think that corvettes were some kind of local defence vessel, and then incorporating his arguments in a formal submission to the Admiralty. Within three weeks, Sub-Lieutenant Morell was appointed to Compass Rose, additional for watchkeeping duties. Morell arrived, fresh from the training establishment, accompanied by an astonishing amount of luggage. He was a very proper young man, in peacetime a junior barrister, a product of the other London which was so great a contrast to the bohemian world that Lockhart knew and worked in. He was grave, slow-moving, and exceedingly courteous. In his brand new and beautifully cut uniform, he seemed far better suited to a diplomatic salon than to Compass Rose's rough and ready wardrobe. He and Bennett could hardly be expected to mix. On the first evening at dinner, when he and Lockhart were alone in the wardroom, he remarked, I understand the first lieutenant comes from one of the Dominions. With an absence of expression which was itself the best substitute for it. Next afternoon, when work was over, he sought out Lockhart and asked him, with some formality, for guidance. The first lieutenant used an expression which is novel to me, he began. I wish you to explain what it means. What was it? asked Lockhart, with an equal gravity. He said, Ah, uh, don't come the acid with me. Morel screwed up his eyes. Come the acid. I must confess, I have not heard that before. What were you talking about? We were discussing the best way of dismantling the firing bar on the Aztec set. It may have been too technical for him, Lockhart said. He's been trained in a rough school. I see. So, coming the acid, it means that you probably corrected him without wrapping it up enough. Morel smiled. It was the first time Lockhart had seen him do so. I could hardly have been more diplomatic. Well, you must have overdone it then. Morel sighed. How strange to meet Scylla and Charybdis in Atlantic waters. Perhaps I should explain the illusion. There were... Do not, said Lockhart, with a fair approximation of Bennett's accent. Come the acid with me. Ah, exclaimed Morel. Now I understand. They both laughed. Lockhart was glad that Morel had joined them. He promised to enliven the wardroom, though with little intention of so doing, and the wardroom could do with all the enlivenment possible. Lockhart himself had his own collision with Bennett soon afterwards. A new Admiralty fleet order decreed that sub-lieutenants over 28 years of age, with three months sea service to their credit, were eligible for a second stripe, if they got the necessary recommendation from their commanding officers. But when, at the due time, he put in his application through Bennett, he met such a barrage of scorn and sarcasm that he could hardly keep his anger. Jesus Christ, Sab, said Bennett. You must be round the bend. Who's going to recommend you for a lieutenant after a couple of convoys? I hope the captain, answered Lockhart evenly. 
It's within the regulations. It's on age as well as sea time. Think you're fit to take Marge or by? Lockhart said nothing. Well, I don't. Bennett went on after a pause. Not for a hell of a long time either. He fingered the sheet of paper on which Lockhart had set out his application. I can't sign this bloody thing, he said peevishly. It's much too early. Let it stand over for a bit. I wanted to go to the captain, said Lockhart stubbornly. Well, I don't. You can't refuse. I can do any bloody thing I like, Bennett flared up. You bloody kids make me sick putting in for promotion before you've hardly got your uniforms. He really had no authority to hold up the application. He was simply extracting the maximum unpleasantness out of it. He said, I'll see about it. There's no rush. I wanted to go to the Admiralty before we sail again. What makes you think the skipper will recommend you? Sneered Bennett. Been doing a bit of crawling? The wrangle, far from edifying, continued on these lines till Bennett, with singular ill grace, agreed to forward the application. In the end, it went through, with Ericsson's recommendation, and Lockhart got his promotion. Thereafter, Bennett addressed him always, with thick irony, as Lieutenant Lockhart. But that did not matter at all. He was a step farther on his way, and the way itself was beginning to seem clearer. The first few convoys followed the pattern of their initiation. They still worked with Viperus as leader of the group. They were still, as a fighting escort, untried by the enemy. There were submarines about, other convoys kept running into them, but their luck held. The log recorded no shot in anger, only a succession of comments on the weather. Whatever the season, it seemed that the Atlantic could never wholly abandon its mood of violence. But then, suddenly, it was time for their first spell of leave. Six days for half the ship's company, and all the officers save one, so that Compass Rose could have her boilers cleaned and a few small repairs carried out. It was their first break since the ship was commissioned five months previously. They felt that they had earned it, and Ericsson privately admitted that they were right. With Mavis, Ferriby spent a wonderful and tender period it was so lovely to see her again, so lovely to be somebody, to be considered and deferred to after the brusque contempt of Compass Rose. He must be absolutely beastly, said Mavis indignantly, when Ferriby had told her something of Bennett's manners and methods. Why do they allow it? It's discipline, said Ferriby vaguely. He did not really believe this, nor had he, for very shame, told her the full story. But he did not want the shadow to stay where it had fallen. The first lieutenant's meant to run the ship, really. And that means the officers as well. But he needn't be so horrid about it. He's like that. They oughtn't to allow it, she said again. I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. Dear Mavis, so sweet and attractive, with her little face screwed up in anger and sadness. He kissed her and said, Let's forget about it. How about going for a walk? If you're not too tired. He looked at her and smiled. Why should I be too tired? She blushed, not meeting his eye. Gordon Ferriby, you're a disgrace. You know quite well what I meant. He felt very masculine as he took her arm. On the first evening of their return from leave, they were having dinner in the wardroom when Bennett, who had been eating with his accustomed fervour, suddenly clapped his hands to his stomach and gave a groan. Jesus Christ, he said. That hurt. What's the matter? said Ericsson, looking at him with non-committal interest. Hell of a pain. Bennett gave another groan and doubled up across the table. His hands were still clasped to his stomach, and his breath came heavily through clenched teeth. Better lie down, said Ericsson. Take it easy for a bit. Jesus, it's agony! He levered himself upright and tottered towards the door. 
reckon I will lie down, he mumbled. It may pass off. He went through the doorway towards his cabin, moaning with great clarity. Bad luck, observed the captain. Bennett complained of pain all next day. He went off to the naval hospital that evening and he did not return. When Ericsson summoned Lockhart to his cabin next morning, he had on his desk two signals which did not go well together. One was their sailing orders and the other was about Bennett. The first lieutenant won't be back for some time, Lockhart, Ericsson began. He's got a suspected duodenal ulcer. We'll sail this afternoon and we'll have to go without him. There's no chance of getting a relief by then. You'll have to take over as number one and organize the watches on that basis. Yes, sir, said Lockhart. His heart, to his secret surprise, had raced for a moment as if to mark a violent pleasure. First lieutenant, it could be done and it would have to be done. He wouldn't have another chance like this one for a very long time. I'll help you with it, Ericsson went on. You should be able to carry on until the relief arrives. I can carry on anyway. Can you? Ericsson looked at him again. Lockhart had spoken with a kind of informal resolution which was a new thing in their relationship. Yes, sir. All right, said Ericsson after a pause. I'll see. Do your best this time anyway. Lockhart walked out of the cabin with that precise determination. They never saw Bennett again. Lockhart's promotion was confirmed, not without some misgivings, by Western Approach's command, and the new officer who arrived to fill the gap, one sub-Lieutenant Baker, was junior to Ferriby and, if his hesitant air was anything to go by, likely to remain so. The new team assembled and settled down, making of Compass Rose a different ship altogether. The wardroom was now a pleasant place where they could relax and feel at ease. The same feeling spread throughout the ship, filtering down to the lower deck, where Bennett's crude methods had aroused the most resentment. Ericsson, observing the general improvement, was pleased. He had gone to a good deal of trouble to get Lockhart's appointment confirmed, and the trouble was worthwhile. Both he and Compass Rose had gained something which might be valuable in the near future. Dunkirk was their signal for joining battle. From then onwards, almost every convoy they escorted suffered some sort of attack, either from U-boats or aircraft, and the loss of ships began to be an inevitable part of their seagoing. Dunkirk drew off many ships from regular convoy escort and some of them were lost, others damaged, and still others had to remain in home waters when it was over, to be on hand in case of invasion. When the Royal Navy turned its attention to the major battle again, it was to find control of the battlefield threatened by a ruthless assault, which quickened and grew with every month that passed. There was another factor in the altered account. The map now showed them a melancholy and menacing picture. Nearly the whole European coastline, from Narvik to Bordeaux, was available to U-boats. And, more important still, as air bases for long-range aircraft. Aircraft could now trail a convoy far out into the Atlantic, calling up U-boats to the attack as they circled out of range. In the three months that followed Dunkirk, over 200 ships were sent to the bottom by these two weapons in combination and the losses continued at something like 50 ships a month till the end of the year. Help was on the way, new weapons, more escorts, more aircraft. But help did not come in time for many ships and men, and for many convoys that made port with great gaps in their ranks. It was on one of these convoys, homeward bound near Iceland, that Compass Rose was blooded. When the alarm bell went, just before midnight, Ferriby left the bridge where he'd been keeping the first watch with Baker and made his way aft towards his depth charges. It was he who had rung the bell as soon as the noise of aircraft and a burst of tracer bullets from the far side of the convoy indicated an attack. 
But though he'd been prepared for the violent clanging and the drumming of feet that followed it, he could not control a feeling of sick surprise at the urgency which now possessed the ship in its first alarm for action. The night was calm, with a bright three-quarter moon which bathed the upper deck in a cold glow and showed them the nearest ships of the convoy in hard, revealing outline. It was a perfect night for what he knew was coming, and to hurry down the length of Compass Rose was like going swiftly to the scaffold. Wainwright, the young torpedo man, was already on the quarterdeck, clearing away the release gear on the depth charges. And as soon as Wainwright spoke, even though it was only the three words, closed up, sir, Ferrobi knew that he also was consumed by nervousness. He found the fact heartening. He took a grip of his voice and said, Get the first pattern ready to drop. And then, as he turned to check up on the depth charge crews, his eye was caught by a brilliant firework display on their beam. The attacking aircraft was now flying low over the centre of the convoy, pursued and harried by gunfire from scores of ships at once. At the top of the centre column, near the end of her run, the aircraft dropped two bombs. One of them fell wide, raising a huge, pluming spout of water which glittered in the moonlight. But the other found its mark. It dropped with an iron clang on some ship which they could not see, and they knew that now they would never see her. For after the first explosion, there was a second one, a huge orange flash which lit the whole convoy and the whole sky at one ghastly stroke. Must have been ammunition, said someone in the darkness, breaking the awed and compassionate silence. Poor Bastards. From the higher vantage point of the bridge, Ericsson had seen the ship hit, the shower of sparks where the bomb fell, and then a moment afterwards the huge explosion that blew her to pieces. In the shocked silence that followed, his voice giving a routine helm order was cool and normal. No one could have guessed the sadness and the anger that filled him, to see a whole crew of men like himself wiped out at one stroke. But even as he raised his binoculars to look at the convoy again, the ship a hundred yards away from them rocked to a sudden explosion and then, on the instant, heeled over at a desperate angle. This time, a torpedo. Ericsson heard it. And even as he jumped to the voice pipe to increase their speed and start zigzagging, he thought, if that one came from outside the convoy, it must have missed us by a few feet. Inside the Aztec hut, Lockhart heard it and started hunting on the danger side without further orders. That was a routine. And even at this moment of surprise and crisis, the routine still ruled them all. Morell, on the forecastle, heard it, and closed up his gun crew again and loaded with starshell. Down in the wheelhouse, Tallow heard it, and gripped the wheel tighter and called out to his quartermasters, Watch that telegraph now! and waited for the swift orders that might follow. Right aft, by the depth charges, Ferriby heard it, and shivered. He glanced downwards at the black water rushing past them, and then at the stricken ship which he could see quite clearly, and he longed for some action in which he could lose himself in his fear. Deep down in the engine room, Chief E.R.A. Watts heard it best of all. It came like a hammer blow, hitting the ship's side a great splitting crack, and when, a few seconds afterwards, the telegraph rang for an increase of speed, his hand was on the steam valve already. He knew what had happened, he knew what might happen next, but it was better not to think of what was going on outside. Down here, in case below the waterline, they must wait and hope and keep their nerve. Ericsson took Compass Rose in a wide half-circle to starboard, away from the convoy, hunting for the U-boat down what he presumed had been the track of the torpedo. But they found nothing that looked like a contact, and presently he circled back again towards the ship that had been hit. She had fallen out of line, letting the rest of the convoy go by. She was sinking fast, and already her screws were out of the water and she was poised for the long plunge. The cries of men in fear came from her, and a thick smell of oil. At one moment, when they had her outlined against the moon, they could see a mass of men packed high in the towering stern, waving and shouting as they felt the ship under them begin to slide down to her grave. Ericsson was faced with a dilemma. 
If he stopped to pick up survivors, he would become a sitting target himself. And he would also lose all chance of hunting for the U-boat. If he went on with the hunt, he would be leaving these men to their death. He decided on a compromise. They would drop a boat and leave it to collect what survivors it could while Compass Rose took another cast away to starboard. Ferriby, summoned to the quarterdeck voice pipe, put every effort he knew into controlling his voice. Ferriby, sir. We're going to drop a boat, sub. Who's your leading hand? Leading seaman Tumbridge, sir. Tell him to pick up a small crew, not more than four, and row over towards the ship. Tell him to keep well clear until she goes down. They may be able to get some boats away themselves, but if not, he'll have to do the best he can. We'll come back for him when we've had another look for the submarine. Right, sir. Quick as you can, Saab. I don't want to stop too long. The boat was lowered swiftly, but when Compass Rose drew away from it and left it to its critical errand, the torpedoed ship was only just afloat, balanced between sea and sky before her last dive. And as Tunbridge took the tiller and glanced in her direction to get his bearings, there was a rending sound which carried clearly over the water, and she started to go down. Tunbridge watched in awe and fear. It had been bad enough to be lured into the darkness from Compass Rose and to watch her fade away and be left alone in a small boat under the stars, with the convoy also fading and a vast, unfriendly sea all around them. But now, with the torpedoed ship disappearing before their eyes and the men shouting and crying as they splashed about in the water and the smell of oil coming across to them thick and choking, it was more like a nightmare than anything else. Tunbridge was 23 years of age, a product of the London slums, conditioned by seven years' naval training. Faced by this ordeal, the fact that he did not run away from it was beyond all normal credit. They did what they could, rowing about in the darkness, guided by the shouting, appalled by the choking cries of men who drowned before they could be reached. They collected 14 men. One was dead, one was dying, eight were wounded, and the rest were shocked and prostrated to a pitiful degree. It was very nearly 15 men. Tunbridge actually had hold of the 15th who was gasping in the last stages of terror and exhaustion. But the film of oil on his naked body made him impossible to grasp. And he slipped away and sank before a rope could be got round him. When there were no more shadows in the water and no more cries to follow, they rested on their oars and waited, alone on the enormous black waste of the Atlantic, alone with the settling wreckage and the reek of oil. And so presently Compass Rose found them. Ferriby, standing in the waist of the ship as the boat was hooked on, wondered what he would see when the survivors came over the side. He was not prepared for the horror of the appearance. First came the ones who could climb aboard themselves. Half a dozen shivering, black-faced men, dressed in the filthy, oil-soaked clothes which they had snatched up when the ship was struck. One of them with his scalp streaming with blood. Another nursing an arm, flayed from wrist to shoulder by scalding steam. They looked about them in wonder, dazed by the swiftness of disaster, by their rescue, by the solid deck beneath their feet. Then, while they were led to the warmth of the mess deck, a sling was rigged for the seriously wounded, and they were lifted over the side on stretchers, some silent, some moaning, some coughing up the fuel oil which was burning and poisoning their intestines. And then, with the boat still bumping alongside in the eerie darkness, came Tunbridge's voice. Go easy. There's a dead man down here. Ferriby had never seen a dead man before. 
and he had to force himself to look at this pitiful relic of the sea. Stone cold, stiffening already, its grey head jerking as it was bundled over the side. An old sailor, unseamanlike and disgusting in death. He wanted to run away. He wanted to be sick. He turned away and busied himself with the hoisting of the boat, not looking behind him as a procession of wrecked and brutalized men was borne off. When the boat was inboard and secure, he turned back again, glad to have escaped some part of the horror. There was nothing left now but the acrid smell of oil and the patches of blood and water on the deck. Nothing, he saw with a gasp of fear and revulsion, but the dead man lying lashed against the rail, a yard from him, rolling as the ship rolled, waiting for daylight and burial. He turned and ran towards the stern, pursued by terror. In the big seaman's mess deck, under the shaded lamps, Lockhart was doing things he had never imagined possible. He had stitched up a gash in a man's head. He had set a broken leg, using part of a bench as a splint. He bound up other cuts and gashes. He did what he could for the man with the burnt arm, who was now insensible. Once, from outside, there was a sound of an explosion, and he looked up. By chance, across the smoky forecastle, the bandaged rows of wounded, the other men still shivering, the whole squalid confusion of the night, he met the eye of leading seaman Phillips. Involuntarily, both of them smiled, to mark a thought which could only be smiled at. If a torpedo hit them now, there would be little chance for any of them, and all this bandaging would be wasted. It was nearly daylight before he finished, and he went up to the bridge to report what he had done at a slow, dragging walk, completely played out. He met Ericsson at the top of the ladder. There was blood on his hands and on the sleeves of his duffel coat. You must have been busy, number one, Ericsson said quietly. What's the score down there? Two dead, sir, answered Lockhart. One more to go, I think. He's been swimming and walking about with a badly burned arm, and the shock is too much. Eleven others. They ought to be all right. Fourteen, said Ericsson. The crew was thirty-six altogether. Lockhart shrugged. There was no answer to that one. And if there had been, he could not have found it in his present mood. How about things up here? He asked. We lost another ship over on the other side of the convoy. That makes three. More than one submarine? I shouldn't think so. She probably crossed over. Good night's work. Lockhart still could not express more than a formal regret. Do you want to turn in, sir? I can finish this watch. No. You get some sleep. I'll wait for Ferriby and Baker. Tumbridge did well, said Lockhart. Yes, and so did you, number one. Lockhart shook his head. I must get a little book on wounds. It's going to come in handy if this sort of thing goes on. There's no reason why it shouldn't, said Ericsson. Three ships in three hours. Probably a hundred men, all told. Easy. Yes, said Lockhart, nodding. A very promising start. After the war, we must ask them how they do it. After the war, said Ericsson levelly, I hope they'll be asking us. They sailed on eleven convoys that year, sometimes to Iceland, sometimes to Gibraltar, sometimes to the pinpoint in mid-Atlantic, which was their rendezvous with the incoming ships. There were many repetitions of that first losing convoy. The tally of survivors gradually mounted. The total of ships lost pursued a steady upward curve. Something, it was clear, would have to be done about this question of survivors if it was to be worthwhile fishing them out of the water, for corvettes, which were detailed for the bulk of this rescue work, were really ludicrously inadequate for the job. They needed a doctor, or at least a qualified sick berth attendant, to see to the wounded. It was senseless to risk the ship in picking them up, only to have them die on board from shock or burns or 
oil poisoning which could not be properly treated. It was on this note of inadequacy, this scrambling waste of effort and courage that 1940 drew to its close. They started the new year with the tide running strongly against all Allied shipping. Over a full two-thirds of the Atlantic, the attackers had the initiative, and they held on to it and gave it ruthless force and effectiveness. Plying to and fro ceaselessly, the convoys fought their battle against a multiplying enemy. The U-boats were now coordinating their attack. They hunted in packs, six or seven in a group, quartering a huge area of the convoy route and summoning their full strength as soon as a contact was obtained. The monthly record of sinkings mounted, 53 in one month, 57 in another. There were countermeasures. Patrolling aircraft extended their range, a number of merchant ships were provided with fighters launched by catapult and the quality of the weapons in the escorts improved slowly. To mark this improvement, one month in the middle of 1941 saw seven U-boats sent to the bottom, the highest total of the war. But seven U-boats was not enough. There were still too many of them hunting and striking, and not enough escorts to screen the convoys. Of this slaughter, Compass Rose saw her full share. It was no longer a surprise when the alarm bell sounded, no longer a shock to see the derelict humanity that was hoisted over the side after a ship went down. It was no longer moving to watch the dying and bury the dead. They developed, they had to develop, a professional inhumanity towards their job, a lack of feeling that was the best guarantee of efficiency. Therabee and Baker shared the first watch, from eight until midnight. Therabee was now a father, and when the two of them were together, he exhibited the first stirrings of paternal consequence. Did you mind you being a girl? Asked Baker one night, when, as usually happened at sea, the conversation turned to the gentler background of home. It didn't seem to matter what it was, as long as she was all right, said Therabee. You get so worried towards the end. Of course, she had her mother there to look after her, but all the same, I was glad when it was over. It was a bit of luck I was on leave when it started, otherwise I don't know what I'd have done, thinking about it happening while we were at sea. My turn for leave next, said Baker, reacting to the cherished word. Two more convoys, I should say, about six weeks. Six weeks. That started in Ferriby, a fresh train of thought which he was not ready to share with Baker or with anyone else. Six weeks was a long time in the Atlantic, when the next six hours, or six minutes for that matter, might bring them disaster. There were so many U-boats on the hunt. Sooner or later he was sure one of them was going to get Compass Rose in its sights. Ferriby was never free of that fear nowadays. It was as if, when Bennett left, he had to exchange one tyranny for another, as if the fear of Bennett would only give way to the fear of being torpedoed. Of all of them on board, Ferriby was the least hardened to what was going on. He could not forget the nodding head of the dead man, that first time they'd picked up survivors. He could not forget the recurrent alarm, the inevitable attack, the slim chance of survival. It was getting towards midnight now, the end of their watch, and this was a time when things so often happened. The bang, the flare from a torpedoed ship, the explosion in the heart of the convoy. And if they did not happen in the first watch, they could happen in the next one, the middle. And that was worst of all. But this was something he could share with no one, and especially not with Mavis, who must now never know the extent of his terror. They had taken a small house outside Liverpool, and he saw her every time Compass Rose was in harbour. The recurrent meeting and separation and goodbye was sweet and harassing at the same time, not helping him at all. More and more, the war was making demands on him beyond his capacity, presenting a bill which his bankrupt spirit could not meet. Tallow, 
now a chief petty officer, was growing positively sleek on his sister Gladys's cooking, and he was deriving a certain amount of amusement from the situation between her and Watts, who had been a persistent and welcome visitor ever since Compass Rose was first stationed at Liverpool. Watts was a widower with grown-up children. Gladys was a widow comfortably past the age of romantic ardour. It was a quiet affair, a placid understanding that, come the end of the war, they would settle down together and make a go of it. When Watts had first broached the subject to Tallow, it was in such a roundabout way that the latter could hardly grasp what he was driving at. But when Watts finally muttered something about getting fixed up after the war, light broke through. Why, that's fine, Jim, exclaimed Tallow. They shook hands awkwardly, not looking at each other, but there was warmth in Tallow's voice as he went on. Best thing that could happen for her, and for you too. You've asked her, eh? Sort of, uh, Watts was still embarrassed by the display of feeling. We've got an understanding like, uh, the only thing is, uh, he paused. What's the trouble? She was a bit worried about you. I mean, she's been housekeeping for you for a long time, hasn't she? She didn't want you to be disappointed. Oh, forget about it, Tallow smiled. Might get married myself one of these days, you never know. You go ahead, Jim. Just name the day. But that was not to be. For Liverpool, the sailor's town, was soon to pay for that label in the most brutal way imaginable. And a tiny part of that payment bore away with it Watt's modest hopes of happiness. Even far down the river, at the Crosby light vessel, they knew that something was wrong. And as they made their way upstream at the tail of the convoy, many of the crew clustered on the upper deck, shading their eyes against the strong May sunlight and looking towards the city they had come to know as home. Morel, standing on the forecastle, trained his glasses upriver towards the liver buildings. There seemed to be a lot of smoke about, and here and there a jagged edge to the skyline which he had never noticed before. At his side, he suddenly heard leading seaman Phillips exclaim, Christ, it's copped a packet. And then he smelt the acrid tang of the smoke blowing downriver, and his eyes, focusing suddenly on a big warehouse just above Gladstone Dock, discovered that it was split from top to bottom, that one half of it was a gigantic heap of rubble, that the rest was blackened and smouldering. His binoculars, traversing steadily across the city and over to the Birkenhead side, showed him many such buildings, and scores of small houses lying ruined in the centre of a great scorched circle. There were fires still burning. There was a heavy pall of smoke lying over the northern part of the city. There were gaps, whole streets missing, rows of houses misshapen and torn. He dropped his glasses shocked by the scale of the destruction, the naked ruin of a city which they had left prosperous and unharmed. As they came alongside the southern quay of the dock basin, a berthing party of half a dozen men from the nearest destroyer ran along to meet them and to take their mooring wires. Leading seaman Phillips, standing high on the forecastle head, called out, What's been going on? One of the berthing party looked up and grimaced. You've missed something, mate, he shouted back. They made a right mess of this town, I can tell you. Bombers coming over every night as thick as bloody sparrows, eight nights on end. There isn't any Lord Street left, they got the lot both sides. Worst bombing of the war, the papers said. From the landing stage, Tallow and Watts walked uphill towards Dock Road. Slowly, because of the blocked roads and the rubble and glass and smashed woodwork which was strewn over the streets. They did not talk to each other because the cruel destruction was saying it all for them. Presently, they turned the last corner, or the place where the last corner should have been, 
and looked down Dock Road. There wasn't a great deal left of Dock Road. The two corner houses just beside them had gone, and three more farther down. And then there was a great hole in the centre of the roadway. And then, farther down still, a ragged heap of rubble where another house had sprawled into the street. Tallow looked at the farthest point of destruction, sick and hurt. He said, That's the one, Jim. I know it. And he started foolishly to run. Watts, possessed by the same urgency, kept pace with him, and they went at a steady jog-trot down the street, past the first lot of wrecked houses, past the second, past the crater in the roadway, and up to the last shattered corner. Number 27 was half ruined by the blast, and so was number 31. Number 29 had taken the full force of a direct hit. Number 29, Dock Road. Under the bright afternoon sunshine, the wreck of the little house seemed mean and tawdry. There was flayed wallpaper flapping in the wind, and half a staircase set at a drunken angle, and the kitchen sink rising like some crude domestic altar from a heap of brickwork. The broken glass and the rubble slurred under their feet as they came to a halt before it. It was not a house anymore, this place where, between voyages, Tallow had been so comfortable and content, and Watts had stumbled out a halting proposal of marriage, and Gladys had made a warm, cheerful haven for them all. It was simply a shapeless mass, slopping over from its own foundation, a heap of dirt and rubbish over which drifted, like a final curse, the smell of burnt-out fire. Some men, a rescue squad in dusty blue overalls, were picking over the ruins. After a moment of hesitation, Tallow accosted the nearest of them. How did it happen? he asked. Scarcely looking at him, the rescue man said, Don't ask bloody silly questions, I'm busy. It's my house, said Tallow without expression. Oh. The rescue man straightened up. Sorry, mate. Direct hit this one. Middle of the raids about five days ago. You've been away? Yes. Just got back. There was silence while the dust stirred and settled. With an effort, Tallow put his question. How about the people inside, then? The rescue man looked away from him and across the street. You can't expect much, mate, sir, not after this. We got them out, two women, and don't know their names. Ask over there at the warden's post. They'll tell you all about it. Where are they dead? asked Dallow. A moment of hesitation, then... Yes, they were dead. On their way across the street to the warden's post, Tallow said, It was probably Mrs. Crossley. She used to sit with Gladys in the evening. Inside the warden's post, a brick shelter on the street corner, three men were sitting at a table playing cards. Two were young, and one was an oldish man with grey hair. As Tallow and Watts entered, one of the young men glanced up and called out in mock alarm, Look out, lads, the Navy's here. The oldish man put down his cards and said, uh, Just in time for a cup of tea. Always glad to see the Navy. Name of Tallow, said Tallow briefly. Number 29, Dock Road, the one across the street. What happened? There was a long, shocked silence while the three men stared at Tallow, the smiles fading from their faces a cheerful welcome evaporating into shame. Then the old man spoke. Mr. Tallow, yes. That was your house, wasn't it? I'm very sorry, very sorry indeed. He fumbled with some papers on the rough deal table 
concealing his raw embarrassment. I reported it to the town hall, of course. Two casualties. Didn't they notify you? We've only just got in. Been at sea for a fortnight. When did it happen? May the 5th. He read the names. Mrs. Bell and Mrs. Crossley. Uh, would they be relatives of yours? Tallow swallowed. Mrs. Bell was my sister. Mrs. Crossley was a friend. One of the young men, the one who had greeted them so cheerfully, stood up suddenly. Take it easy, chum, he said quietly. Here, sit down for a minute. When was the funeral? asked Tallow. He did not sit down. Two days ago. There were some others, you know. Twenty-one altogether. Twenty-one? All from Dock Road? Yes, it was a bad night. Standing in the entrance behind Tallow, what stirred suddenly? Where was it? The funeral, I mean. The Croft Road Cemetery. It was very tasteful, I can assure you of that. The old man paused and his tone altered suddenly. They can't have known anything, Mr. Tallow. It was all over in a second. No, said Tallow. I see that. It's a sort of comfort, said the old man gently. Yes, said Tallow. Thank you. The smiling weather of that late summer helped them to settle down to seagoing again. They were now part of an increased escort, two destroyers and five corvettes, charged with the care of 21 deep-laden ships bound for Gibraltar. This was their real task, and they turned to it again with the readiness of men who, knowing that the task was crucial, were never wholly convinced that the Navy could afford to let them take a holiday. The treachery of that perfect weather, the lure of the easy transition, were not long in the declaring. It started with a single aircraft, a four-engined Fokker Wolf reconnaissance plane, which closed the convoy from the eastwards and then began to go round them in slow circles, well out of range of any gunfire they could put up. It had happened to them before, and there was little doubt of what the plane was doing, pinpointing the convoy, shadowing it, noting exactly its course and speed, and then reporting back to some central authority, as well as tipping off any U-boats that might be nearby. The change this time lay in the fact that it was occurring so early in the voyage, and that, as they watched the plane circling and realized its mission, the sun was pouring down from a matchless sky onto a sea as smooth and as lovely as old glass, hardly disturbed at all by the company of ships that crossed it on their way southwards. At dusk, the plane withdrew, droning away eastwards at the same level pace. Up on the bridge, preparing to darken ship and close down for the night, they watched it go with gloomy foreboding. There was nothing out of the ordinary that night, except a signal at eleven o'clock addressed by the Admiralty to their convoy. There are indications of five U-boats in your area, with others joining, it warned them, and left them to make the best they could of it. As soon as darkness fell, the convoy changed its course from the one the aircraft had observed, going off at a sharp tangent in the hope of escaping the pursuit. Perhaps it was successful. Perhaps the U-boats were still out of range, for the five hours of darkness passed without incident, while on the radar screen, the compact square of ships and the outlying fringe of escorts moved steadily forwards, undisturbed. It was at noon on the following day that the first ship was torpedoed and set on fire. The swift destruction of that first ship marked the beginning of an eight-day battle which took steady toll of the convoy, thinning out the ships each night with horrible regularity. They fought back. They did their best. But the odds against them were too high, the chinks in their armor impossible to safeguard against so many circling enemies. By the end of two days, six ships were gone, and there was still a week to go before they were near the shelter of land. But now they had a stroke of luck. 
a succession of two dark nights which, combined with a violent evasive alteration of course, threw the pursuit off the scent. Though they were still on the alert, and the tension, particularly at night, was still there, yet for 48 hours they enjoyed a wonderful sense of respite. The convoy, now reduced to 15 ships, cracked on speed, romping along towards the southern horizon in the promise of safety. Aboard Compass Rose, a cheerful optimism succeeded the sense of ordained misfortune which had begun to take a hold, and the many survivors whom they had picked up, wandering about the upper deck in their blankets and scraps of clothing, or lining the rails to stare out at the convoy, lost gradually the strained refugee look which was so hard on a naval conscience. Hope grew. They might see harbour after all. So it was, for two days and two nights. And then the aircraft, casting wide circles in the clear dawn sky, found them again. They all stared at it, every man on the bridge, bound together by the same feeling of anger and hatred. It was so unfair. U-boats they could deal with, or at least the odds were more level. With a bit of luck in the weather and the normal skill of sailors, the convoy could faint and twist and turn and hope to escape their pursuit. But this predatory messenger from another sphere, destroying the tactical pattern, eating into any distance they contrived to put between themselves and the enemy, this betrayer could never be balked. They felt a helpless sense of ineffectual rage. Clearly, it was all going to happen again. Swiftly, the aircraft must have done its work, and the U-boats could not have been far away. Within 12 hours, back they came, and that night cost the convoy two more ships out of the dwindling fleet. The sixth day dawned, the sixth night came. Punctually at midnight, the alarm bell sounded, and the first distress rocket soared up into the night sky, telling of a ship mortally hit and calling for help. She burned for a long time, that ship reddening the water, lifting sluggishly with the swell, becoming at last a flickering oily pyre which the convoy left slowly astern. By noon of the seventh day, the tally of ships remaining was eleven. Eleven out of the original twenty-one. Behind them were ten good merchant ships sunk and countless men drowned and one of the escorts lost as well. It was horrible to think of the hundreds of miles of sea that lay in their wake, strewn with oil and wreckage and corpses. Compass Rose had never been so crowded, so crammed with survivors. It was lucky indeed that they had the new sick bay and the sick berth attendant. Lockhart could never have coped with the continual flow single-handed. They had collected a huge complement of rescued men, far outnumbering their own crew. There were 14 merchant navy officers in the wardroom and 121 others, seamen, firemen, cooks, laskers, Chinese, thronging the upper deck by day and at night crowding into the mess decks to eat and sleep and wait for the next dawn. The last night cost three more ships. And one of them, a loaded tanker, was a special concern of Compass Rose. It was she who was nearest when the ship was struck, and she circled round as the oil, cascading and spouting from the tanker's open side, took fire and spread over the surface of the water like a flaming carpet in a pitch-black room. Silhouetted against this roaring backcloth, which soon rose to fifty feet in the air, Compass Rose was visible for miles around, even in swift movement, she made a perfect target. And Ericsson, trying to decide whether to stop and pick up survivors or whether the risk would not be justified, could visualize clearly what they would look like when stationary against this wall of flame. Compass Rose, with her crew and her painfully collected shipload of survivors, would be a sitting mark from ten miles away. But they had been detailed as a rescue ship. There were men in the water, there were boats from the tanker already lowered and pulling away from the tire of flame. There was a job to be done, if the risk were acceptable. 
if it was worth hazarding two hundred lives in order to gain fifty more. It was Ericsson's decision alone. The order, when it came, was swift and decisive. Stop engines. Stop engines, sir. Engines stopped. Wheel amidship, sir. Number one. Sir, said Lockhart. Stand by to get those survivors in board. We won't lower a boat. They'll have to swim or row towards us. God knows they can see us easily enough. Use a megaphone to hurry them up. Aye, aye, sir. As Lockhart turned to leave the bridge, the captain added, almost conversationally, We don't want to waste any time, number one. All over the ship, a prickling silence fell as Compass Rose slowly came to a stop and waited, rolling gently, lit by the glare from the fire. From the bridge, every detail of the upper deck could be picked out. There was no flickering in this huge illumination, simply a steady glow which threw a black shadow on the sea behind them, which showed them naked to the enemy. No submarine within 50 miles could miss this beacon, no submarine within five could resist chancing a torpedo. No submarine within two could fail to hit the silhouetted target. A boat drew alongside, bumping and scraping. Lockhart called out, Hook on forward! There were sounds of scrambling. An anonymous voice, foreign, slightly breathless, said, God bless you for stopping. The work of collection began. It did not take long, save in their own minds. But coming towards the end of the long, continued ordeal of the voyage, when there was no man on the ship who was not near to exhaustion, those minutes spent motionless in the limelight had a creeping and paralytic tension. If we don't buy it this time, said Wainwright, the torpedo man, standing by his depth charges and staring at the flames, Jerry doesn't deserve to win the war. As the minutes passed, while they collected three boatloads of survivors and a handful of swimmers, and the huge circle of fire gave its steady illumination, they seemed to be getting deeper and deeper into a situation from which they would never be able to retreat. The men who had work to do were lucky. The men who simply waited, like Ericsson on the bridge or the stokers below the waterline, knew in those few agonizing minutes the meaning of fear. It never happened. That was the miracle of that night. Perhaps some U-boat fired and missed. Perhaps those within range, content with their success, had submerged for safety's sake and broken off the attack. At any rate, Compass Rose was allowed her extraordinary hazard without having to settle the bill. When there were no more men to pick up, she got underway again. The returning pulse of her engine, heard and felt throughout the ship, came like some incredible last-minute respite, astonishing them all. She drew away from the flames and the smell of oil with her extra load of survivors snatched from the very mouth of danger and her flaunting gesture unchallenged. They had taken the chance, and it had come off. Perhaps it would not do to think too much about it. Perhaps it was better to bury the moment as quickly as possible and forget it and not take that chance again. And then, as daylight strengthened, they witnessed the last cruel item of the voyage. Lagging behind with some engine defect, another ship was hit just before dawn. She sank slowly, but owing to bad organization or the villainous list which the torpedoing gave her, no boats got away. For her crew, it was a time for swimming, for jumping into the water, and striking out away from the fatal downward suction and trusting to luck. Compass rose, dropping back to come to her aid, circled round as the ship began to disappear. And then, as she dipped below the level of the sea and the swirling ripples began to spread outwards from a central point which was no longer there, Ericsson turned his ship's bows towards the centre of disaster, and the bobbing heads which dotted the surface of the water. Just as he was opening his mouth to give the order for lowering a boat, the Asdik set picked up a contact, an undersea echo so crisp and well-defined, 
that it could only be one thing, a U-boat. Lockhart, at his action station in the Aztec compartment, felt his heart miss a beat as he heard that echo. He called through the open window, echo bearing 225, moving left, and bent over the Aztec set in acute concentration. Erickson increased the revolutions again and turned away from the indicated bearing, meaning to increase the range. If they were to drop depth charges, they would need a longer run-in to get up speed. In his turn, he called out, What's it look like, number one? Lockhart said, Submarine, sir. Can't be anything else. He continued to call out the bearing and the range of the contact. Erickson prepared to take the ship in, at attacking speed, and to drop a pattern of depth charges on the way. And then, as Compass Rose turned inwards towards the target, gathering speed for the onslaught, they all noticed something which had escaped their attention before. The place where the U-boat lay, the point where they must drop their charges, was alive with swimming survivors. The captain drew in his breath sharply at the sight. There were about 40 men in the water, concentrated in a small space. If he went ahead with the attack, he must for certain kill them all. He knew well enough, as did everyone on board, the effect of depth charges exploding underwater, the splitting crash which made the sea jump and boil and spout skywards, the aftermath of torn seaweed and dead fish which always littered the surface after the explosion. Now there were men instead of fish and seaweed. Men swimming towards him in confidence and hope. And yet the U-boat was there, one of the pack which had been harassing and bleeding them for days on end, the destroying menace which must have priority because of what it might do to other ships and other convoys in the future. He could hear the echo on the relay loudspeaker. He acknowledged Lockhart's judgment where the Aztec set was concerned. As the second sped by and the range closed, he fought against his doubts and against the softening instinct of mercy. The book said, attack at all costs. And this was a page out of the book. And the men swimming in the water did not matter at all. For a few moments longer, he tried to gain support and confidence for what he had to do. What's it look like now, number one? The same, sir. Solid echo, exactly the right size. It must be a U-boat. Is it moving? Very slowly. There are some men in the water just about there. There was no answer. The range decreased as Compass Rose ran in. They were now within 600 yards of the swimmers and the U-boat. The fatal coincidence which had to be ignored. What's it look like now? Erickson repeated. Just the same. Seems to be stationary. It's the strongest contact we've ever had. There are some chaps in the water. Well, there's a U-boat just underneath them. All right then, thought Erickson, with a new unlooked-for access of brutality to help him. All right, we'll go for the U-boat. With no more hesitation, he gave the order. Attacking, stand by, to the depth charge positions aft. And having made this sickening choice, he swept into the attack with a deadened mind, intent only on one kind of kill, pretending there was no other. Many of the men in the water waved wildly as they saw what was happening. Some of them screamed. Some threw themselves out of the ship's path and thrashed furiously in the hope of reaching safety. Others, slower-witted or nearer to exhaustion, still thought that Compass Rose was speeding to their rescue and continued to wave and smile almost to their last moment. The ship came in like an avenging angel, cleaving the very centre of the knots of swimmers. The amazement and horror on their faces was reflected aboard Compass Rose where many of the crew, particularly among the depth charge parties aft, could not believe what they were being called upon to do. Compass Rose swept in among the swimmers, catching some of them in her screw, while the firing bell sounded and the charges rolled over the stern or were rocketed outwards from the throwers. There was a deadly pause, while for a few moments the men aboard Compass Rose and the men left behind in her wake stared at each other in pity and fear and a kind of basic disbelief. And then with a huge hammer crack, 
the depth charges exploded. Mercifully, the details were hidden in the flurry and roar of the explosion. And the men must all have died instantly, shocked out of life by the tremendous pressure of the sea upon their bodies. When they ran back to the explosion area, with the Asdik silent and the contact not regained, it was as if to some aquarium where poisoned water had killed every living thing. Men floated high on the surface, like dead goldfish. Most of them were disintegrated or pulped out of human shape. No one looked at Ericsson as they left that place. If they had done so, they might have been shocked by his expression and his extraordinary pallor. By the time they were past the Straits and had smelt the burnt smell of Africa blowing across from Ceuta and had shaped a course for Gibraltar Harbour, they were all far off balance. It had gone on too long. It had failed too horribly. It had cost too much. They had been at action stations for virtually eight days on end, missing hours of sleep, making do with scratch meals. There had hardly been a moment of the voyage when they could forget the danger that lay in wait for them and the days of strain that stretched ahead. Through it all, they had had to preserve an alertness and a keyed-up efficiency hard enough to maintain in normal circumstances. And it had all been in vain. It had all been wasted. They had lost 14 ships out of the original 21, two-thirds of the entire convoy. Viperus had sunk one U-boat. A second had probably been destroyed. And Compass Rose herself had collected 175 survivors. But this seemed nothing much when set alongside the total loss of lives. It seemed nothing much when measured against the men they had depth-charged and killed instead of saving. At half past eight on the evening of their arrival in Gibraltar, there was a knock at the door of the captain's cabin. Ericsson, sitting in his armchair with a glass in his hand and a half-empty bottle of gin on the side table, called out, Come in, in a voice from which all expression save an apathetic listlessness had vanished. He had been drinking steadily since four o'clock in an attempt to blur the edges of certain scenes from their recent voyage. It had not been successful, as a glance at his face showed all too plainly. Are you all right, sir? said Lockhart. No, answered Ericsson readily. I don't mind telling you that I'm not. His tone was thick and slurring. It was the first time Lockhart had ever heard it so, and after these two years of close association, it was hard to identify the surrendered voice with the competent one he knew so well. You've got to forget all about it, said Lockhart, suddenly breaking through the normal barrier of reserve that separated them. It's no good worrying about it now. You can't change anything. There was a submarine, shouted Ericsson in a furious voice. He was now helplessly drunk. I'm bloody well sure of it. It's all in the report. It was my fault anyway, said Lockhart. I identified it as a submarine. If anyone killed those men, I killed them. Ericsson looked up at him. Incredibly, there were tears in his eyes. Lockhart looked at them in amazement and compassion. How moving was that pale working face? How comforting after their ordeal, the glistening tears of this strong man. He made as if to speak, wanting to forestall Ericsson and save him from further revelation. But the other man suddenly said in an almost normal voice, no one killed them. It's the war. The whole bloody war. We've just got to do these things and say our prayers at the end. On the sixth day of their journey home from Gibraltar, late in the forenoon watch, 
Chief E.R.A. Watts came up to the bridge with a worried frown on his face. So far, things had been going well. There'd been no shadowing aircraft, no scares about U-boats waiting for them, no drama of any sort. It made a nice change. But now, there was a chance of things not going well at all, and it was he who had to break the news. Captain, sir. Watts stood at the back of the bridge, awkwardly shifting his feet. Anything wrong, Chief? said Erickson. Afraid so, sir. Watts came forward, his face full of concern. I've got a bearing I don't like the feel of at all. Running hot, it is nearly red hot. I'll like to stop and have a look at it, sir. Any good if we slow down? I don't want to stop if we can help it. Watts shook his head vigorously. If we keep the shaft turning, it's liable to seize up, sir. And I can't trace the oil line back from the main feed unless we stop the engines. It's one of those awkward corners, the after bearing right up against the gland space. Erickson frowned. They would have to do the least healthy thing in the war at sea. Stop in mid-ocean with their engine put out of commission. All right, Chief, he said. I'll send a signal and then ring down for you to stop. Be as quick as you can. They were just in visual touch with Viperus, who was zigzagging in broad sweeps across the van of the convoy. When Compass Rose signaled her news, the answer was laconic. Act independently. Keep me informed. Acknowledge, said Erickson briefly to Rose, who was signalman of the watch. Then, starboard ten, stop engines, he called down to the wheelhouse. And Compass Rose, turning in a wide sweep away from the convoy, lost way and came gradually to a standstill. The repairs did not take all night, but they took many trying hours of it. There was nothing to do but wait. Watch succeeded watch. The hands tiptoed delicately to their stations instead of clumping along the deck or stamping their sea boots on the iron ladder as they usually did. Compass Rose floated motionless, with the black water occasionally slapping against her side. A brilliant quarter moon hung in the mid-Atlantic sky. Throughout the ship, there was the same tension, the same rage against the bloody stokers down below who had let the engine get gummed up and were now loafing and fiddling about. Lockhart had it in mind to give the watch on deck, and the other spare hands something definite to do to take their attention away from the present danger. But everything he thought of, such as fire drill or lowering a boat to the waterline, involved noise, and probably the flashing of torches on the upper deck, and in the end he abandoned the idea and left them alone. Waiting in idleness was bad for the nerves, but the risk attending anything else might be worse still. Erickson spent all these hours up on the bridge, Mostly, he stared at the water and the horizon, sometimes at the bright moon which no cloud would obscure. Occasionally, he watched the shadowy figures on the upper deck, the men who waited there in silent groups, collected round the guns or the boats, instead of going below and turning in. In the cold hour that stretched between 2 and 3 a.m., with the moon clouded and the water black and fathomless as sable, there was a step on the bridge ladder. But now, it was a different sort of step. Cheerful, quick mounting, no longer stealthy. It was Chief E.R.A. Watts. Captain, sir, he called to the vague figure hunched over the front of the bridge. Erickson, stiff and cold with his long vigil, turned awkwardly towards him. Yes, Chief, ready to move, sir. So that was that, thought Erickson, standing up and stretching gratefully. The relief was enormous, flooding in till it seemed to reach every part of his body. He felt like shouting his congratulations, seizing Watts' hand and shaking it, giving way to his light-headed happiness. But all he said was, Thank you, Chief. Very well done. And then to the voice pipe, Wheelhouse! Wheelhouse bridge, sir! came the quartermaster's voice, startled from some dream of home. Rings stand by, main engines. Very soon they were off, steaming swiftly northward, chasing the convoy. 
The revolutions mounted, the whole ship grew warm and alive and full of hope again. There was no need to look back. They had, by all the luck in the world, left nothing of themselves behind and given nothing to the enemy. At about six o'clock, with the first dawn lightening the sky to the eastwards, they got the convoy on the very edge of the radar screen. Lockhart, who was officer of the watch, looked at the blurred echo appreciatively. It was still many miles ahead, and they would not be in direct touch till mid-morning, but it put them on the map again. They were no longer alone on the waste of water that might have been their grave. The morning watch progressed. Towards its ending, at eight o'clock, the light grew to the eastward, blanching the dark water. The engine revolutions were now set near their maximum. Compass Rose's course was steady, aiming for the centre of the convoy ahead. Lockhart had nothing to do but stamp warmth into his feet and keep an appraising eye on the radar screen as the range closed and the pattern of ships hardened and took shape. His thoughts wandered. He responded automatically as the quartermaster and the lookouts changed for the final half hour of the watch. Compass rose, breasting the long Atlantic swell and shifting gently under his feet, might have been a train rocking over the last set of points as it ran into Euston Station. At the end of the platform there would be... He jerked to attention suddenly as the bell rang from the radar compartment. Radar, bridge. Lockhart bent to the voice pipe. Bridge. The voice of the radar operator, level, rather tired, not excited, came up to him. I'm getting a small echo astern of the convoy, sir. Can you see it on the repeater? Lockhart looked at the radar screen beside the voice pipe, a replica of the one in the operator's compartment, and nodded to himself. It was true. Between the convoy and themselves, there was now a single small echo, flickering and fading on the screen like a candle guttering in a gentle draught. He watched it for half a minute before speaking. It was never more than a luminous pinpoint of light, but it always came up. It was persistently there all the time. It was a contact, and it had to be accounted for. He bent to the voice pipe again. Yes, I've got it. What do you make of it? Then, before the man could answer, he asked, Who's that on the set? Sellers, sir. Sellers, thought Lockhart. Their leading radar mechanic. A reliable operator, a man worth asking questions. He said again, what do you make of it? Hard to tell, sir, answered Sellers. It's small, but it's there all the time, keeping pace with the convoy. Could it be a back echo off the ships? I don't think so, sir. Sellers' voice was dubious. Well, the angle's wrong for a start. Well, a straggler, then. It's a bit small for a ship, sir. Do you see the ship right out to starboard, probably one of the escorts? That one's a lot bigger. Lockhart stared at the radar screen. On the edge of the convoy pattern, away to starboard, was a single detached echo, which was probably a corvette, and it was appreciably bigger than the speck of light which they were querying. He found himself hesitating, on the verge of reporting the strange echo to the captain, and yet not wanting to wake him up from his deserved sleep without good reason. It could be one of many things. A fault in the set, a straggler from the convoy, though its size was against that. It could conceivably be a rainstorm, or it could be something that they really wanted to see. After watching for a full two minutes, while the echo strengthened slightly, maintaining level pace with the convoy as before, he said to Sellers, keep your eye on it, and then unwillingly he crossed to the captain's voice pipe and pressed the bell. When Erickson came up to the bridge, knuckling his eyes and rubbing his stiff face, he was not in the best of tempers. He had had a bare four hours sleep, interrupted by the first convoy report, and to have it broken again, just because there was a bloody seagull perched on the radar aerial, and the first lieutenant hadn't got the sense to shoo it away, did not seem to him the best way of greeting the happy dawn. He bent to the voice pipe and cleared his throat with a growl. Radar! Radar, bridge, answered Sellers. What about this echo? Still lesser. He gave the range and bearing. 
That makes her about ten miles astern of the last ship of the convoy. Nothing wrong with a set, is there? No, sir, said Sellers, with the brisk air of a man who, at ten minutes to eight on a cold morning, was disinclined for this sort of slur, even coming from a bad-tempered captain. Hmm. Ericsson looked at the red screen again, while Lockhart, watching him, smiled to himself. It was clear that his bad temper was fighting a losing battle with his acknowledgement of Sellers' competence. Sound action stations, said Ericsson, straightening up suddenly, and to the wheelhouse in the same sharp voice. Full ahead, steer ten degrees to starboard. His call for action stations had not been much more than an impulse, but certainly they had picked up an odd-looking echo, one of the most promising so far. It was possible that this time they were really on to something. Momentarily, he raised his binoculars and peered ahead, but the morning mist lay all round the horizon, and there was nothing to be seen. He looked down at the radar screen again, and then bent to the voice pipe. Report your target. Sellers gave the range and the bearing of the contact. Whatever it was, it was still moving at the slow convoy speed, and they were overhauling it rapidly. It's gaining strength a bit, sir. Same size, but a firmer echo. Must be something pretty solid. That was what the picture on the radar screen showed. The whole convoy had emerged now, a compact square of ships, with the outlying escort showing clearly, and the small stranger swimming along behind. Ericsson had begun to believe in it. For the first time, he felt he was watching a U-boat behaving according to the book, trailing a convoy just out of sight and waiting for dusk to come. But what this U-boat didn't know about was the straggling escort left behind, the ship outside the picture which was hurrying in to spoil it. If they could just get within range before they were spotted. Compass Rose ran on. The bow wave creamed under her forefoot. The boiling wake spread behind her, whipping against the wind with rough impatience as she drove towards her prey. The sun was over the horizon now, a pale sun which melted the mist and set the waves sparkling for ten and fifteen miles ahead. A cheerful sun which was on their side and had come up to help them. The rigging began to whine. The trembling of the bow plating as it thrust and divided the water could be felt all over the upper deck. Chief must be giving it stick, thought Ericsson with a grin of satisfaction. That'll wake up those loafing stokers. Report your target, he said for the fifth or sixth time. From below, Seller's voice, excited and jubilant, confirmed the dwindling range, the certainty of a lively rendezvous. For Ericsson... It was as if the whole ship were gathering itself together under his hand, getting wound up taut for the spring. It was for this that they had waited so long and sweated so hard. He crossed to the compass platform, took an exact bearing from the last radar report, raised his glasses and stared along the line. Almost immediately, he saw it. It was a square speck of black on the horizon. It was the conning tower of a U-boat, even as he looked at it, it lifted to the long swell, and he saw at its base a plume of white, the wash thrown off by the submerged hull. Far ahead of it, there were some stray wisps of smoke, the telltale marks of the convoy which was betraying itself from over twenty miles away. He straightened up with a jerk and whipped to the front of the bridge. Morel, he snapped. Morel looked up. Sir? There's a U-boat on the surface dead ahead. Far out of range at the moment, but be ready. We want to get a couple of shots in before she dives, if we can get near enough. All over the ship, the next five minutes were intense and crowded. The warning of immediate action was passed to Fedder beyond the depth charges aft and then to the engine room. Crack it on, Chief, said Ericsson crisply down the voice pipe. We've only got a certain amount of time to play with. Compass Rose began to romp across the sea towards her target. Under pressure from the last few pounds of steam, she seemed to be spurning the water in a desperate attempt to close the range before she was discovered. Through Ericsson's glasses, the square speck of the conning tower was bigger now. It had gained in detail. It had a variety of light and shade. It even had the head and shoulders of a man silhouetted against the hard horizon. A man gazing stolidly ahead, ludicrously intent on his arc of duty. 
the distance shortened. Seller's voice rose steadily up the scale as he reported the closing range. Presently, a totally unfamiliar bell rang on the bridge. The bell from the four-inch gun. A morel with the air of a man presenting his compliments on some purely speculative occasion said, I think I could reach him now, sir. The range was four sea miles, 8,000 yards. It was a long shot for a small gun. It might spoil the whole thing. But surely, thought Ericsson, that stolid man in the conning tower must turn round and see them and take the U-boat in a steep dive down to safety. He delayed for a moment longer, weighing the chances of discovery against the limitation of the valiant pop gun which was their main armament. Then he leant over the front of the bridge and nodded permission to Morel. The roar of the gun could hardly have followed more swiftly. Morel's finger must have been hovering very near the trigger. It was a good shot, but it was not good enough for their crucial circumstances. The spout of grey-white water which leapt skywards was 30 yards ahead of the U-boat, the best alarm signal she could ever have had. The man in the conning tower turned as if he could hardly credit his senses. Then he ducked down as if plucked from below and the conning tower was empty. In the expectant silence, their gun roared again. Ericsson swore aloud as this time the shot fell short and the tall column of water unsighted them. When it fell back into the sea and their vision cleared, the U-boat was already going down at a steep angle in a fluster of disturbed water. Whatever the state of her lookout, she must have had her crash diving routine worked out to perfection. In a matter of seconds, the hull and most of the conning tower were submerged. Morel got in a third shot before the surface of the sea was blank but in the flurry of her dive, it was difficult to spot its exact fall. It seemed to land close alongside. It might have hit her. She was moving to the right as she disappeared. Ericsson shouted, She's down, Lockhart! Almost immediately, Lockhart's tense voice answered, In contact! The pinging echo of the Asdic contact was loud and clear, audible all over the bridge. Lockhart watched in extreme nervous excitement as the operators settled down to hold on to it. They could not lose it now when the U-boat had been right before their eyes a few seconds ago. Moving quickly right, sir, Lockhart called out and nodded to himself as Ericsson laid a course to cut the corner and intercept. He rang the warning bell to the depth charges aft. They were now very near and the sound of the contact was getting blurred, merging with the noise of the transmission. This was the moment when luck could take a hand. If the U-boat chose her moment rightly and made a violent alteration of her course, she might slip out of the lethal area of the coming explosion. There were a few more seconds of waiting while they covered the last remaining yards of the attack. Then Lockhart pressed the firing bell and a moment later the depth charges were down. The whole surface of the sea jumped as the pattern exploded. The columns of water shot high into the air. It seemed to all of them unfair, scarcely believable, in fact, that the shattered U-boat did not shoot up at the same time. So sure were they that they must have hit her. As Compass Rose ran on and the shocked sea subsided, they were left, staring, voiceless with expectation, at the great patch of discoloured water that marked the explosion area. Someone on the bridge said, any minute now. And then the U-boat rose in their wake like a huge, unwieldy fish, black and gleaming in the sunlight. A great roar went up from the men on the upper deck, a howl of triumph. The U-boat came up bows first at an extraordinary angle, blown right out of her proper trim by the force of the explosion. Clearly, she was for the moment beyond control. The water sluiced and poured from her casings as she rose, Great bubbles burst around her conning tower. Gouts of oil spread outwards from the crushed plating amidships. Open fire, shouted Ericsson. And for a few moments, it was Baker's chance and his alone. The two-pounder pom-pom set just behind the funnel was the only gun that could be brought to bear. The staccato force of its firing shook the still air and the red glowing tracer shells began to chase each other low across the water towards the U-boat. She had now fallen back on a level keel and for the moment she rode at her proper trim. Bright flashes came from her bows, and small yellow mushrooms of cordite smoke followed them. As Compass Rose came round again, listing sharply under her full helm, the machine guns on her bridge and her signal deck joined in with an immense clatter. The U-boat settled a little lower, 
and men began to clamber and pour out of her conning tower, stumbling over the uneven deck, their hands above their heads, waving and shouting at Compass Rose. Cease fire, said Ericsson. Wheel amidships, stop engines. Stand by to pick up survivors. The wonderful moment was over. The next convoy was north about. That is, it was routed past the coast of Scotland, between the Isle of Lewis and the mainland, through the troubled, tide-ridden water of the Minches, and then westwards from Cape Wrath towards the open sea. It was very cold within sight of Iceland. Compass Rose, running southwestward past the frozen coastline after delivering four ships independently to Reykjavik, had a rime of bitter frost all over her upper works. The watch on deck, stamping their feet and blowing through numbed lips, stared indifferently at this strange island on which the pale afternoon sun glinted as upon an iced cake left by the kitchen window sill. At four o'clock, Ericsson came up to the bridge, checked their position and rang down for increased speed. The diversion had put them a long way astern of the main body of the convoy, and he wanted to catch up before midnight if possible. It grew colder still as night fell. The torpedo struck Compass Rose as she was moving at almost her full speed. She was hit squarely about 12 feet from her bows. There was one slamming explosion and the noise of ripping and tearing metal and the fatal sound of seawater flooding in under great pressure. A blast of heat from the stricken forecastle rose to the bridge like a hideous waft of incense. She veered wildly from her course and came to a shaking stop like a dog with a bloody muzzle. Her bows were very nearly blown off, and her stern was already starting to cant in the air, almost before the way was off the ship. At the moment of disaster, Ericsson, Lockhart and Wells were on the bridge. The same incredulous shock hit them all like a sickening body blow. They could not believe that Compass Rose had been struck, but the ugly angle of the deck must only have one meaning, and the noise of things sliding about below their feet confirmed it. There was another noise, too. A noise which momentarily paralyzed Ericsson's brain and prevented him thinking at all. It came from a voice pipe connecting the forecastle with the bridge. An agonized animal howling like a hundred dogs going mad in a pit. It was the men caught by the explosion, which must have jammed their only escape. Up the voice pipe came their shouts, their crazy hammering, their screams for help. But there was no help for them. With an executioner's hand, Ericsson snapped the voice pipe cover shut, cutting off the noise. To Wells he said, Call Vipers an RT, plain language, say, Torpedoed in position 050 degrees 30 miles astern of you. To Lockhart he said, Clear away boats and rafts, but wait for the word. The deck started to tilt more acutely still. There was a crash from below as something heavy broke adrift and slid down the slope. Steam began to roar out of the safety valve alongside the funnel. Well said. The RT smashed, sir. It's useless. Down in the wardroom, the noise and shock had been appalling. The explosion was in the very next compartment, and the bulkhead had buckled and sagged towards them just above the table they were eating at. They all leapt to their feet and jumped for the doorway. For a moment, there were five men at the foot of the ladder leading to the upper deck. Morell, Ferriby, Baker, Karslick and Tomlinson, the second steward. As the group struggled, it had an ugly illusion of panic, though it was in fact no more than the swift reaction to danger. Someone had to lead the way up the ladder. By the compulsion of their peril, they had all got there at the same time. Morell suddenly turned back against the fierce rush buffeted his way through and darted into his cabin. Above his bunk was a photograph of his wife. He seized it and thrust it inside his jacket. He ran out again and found himself already alone. The others had all got cleared away, even during the few seconds of his absence. Just as he reached the foot of the ladder, there was an enormous cracking noise behind him. He turned, and through the wardroom door he saw the bulkhead split asunder and the water burst in. It flooded towards him like a cataract, 
Quickly, though, he moved up the ladder. He was waist-deep before he reached the top step, and the water seemed to suck greedily at his thighs as he drew himself clear. He shook himself in fear and relief and ran out into the open, where in the freezing night air the shouting was already wild, the deck already steep under his feet. Down in the engine room, three minutes after the explosion, Watts and E.R.A. Broughton were alone, waiting for the order of release from the bridge. They knew it ought to come. They trusted that it would. Watts had been on the plate when the torpedo struck home. On his own initiative, he had stopped the engine, and then, as the angle of their list increased, he had opened the safety valve and let the pressure off the boilers. Now they waited, side by side in the deserted engine room, the old ERA and the young apprentice. Watts noticed that Broughton was crossing himself and remembered he was a Roman Catholic. Good luck to him tonight. The bell from the bridge rang sharply, and he put his mouth to the voice pipe. Engine room! he called. Chief, said the captain's faraway voice. Leave it and come up. That was all, and it was enough. Up you go, lad, he said to Broughton. We're finished here. Is she sinking? asked Broughton uncertainly. No, with me on board. Jump to it. The open space between the boats was a dark shambles. Men blundered to and fro, cursing wildly, cannoning into each other, slipping on the unaccustomed slope of the deck. Above their heads, the steam from the safety valve was reaching a crescendo of noise, as if the ship was screaming her rage and defiance at the same time. One of the boats was useless. It could not be launched at the angle Compass Rose had now reached. The other had jammed in its chocks. The men left the boats, which in their mortal need had failed them, and made for the Carly floats. They blundered into each other once more and ran full tilt into the funnel guys and shouted fresh curses at the confusion. Tumbridge started them lifting the raft that was on the high side of the ship and bringing it across to the other rail. In the dark, with half a dozen fear-driven men heaving and wrenching at it, it was as if they were already fighting each other for the safety it promised. Then he stood back, looking up at the bridge where the next order, the last order of all, must come from. Erickson realized that she was going and that nothing could stop her. The bridge now hung over the sea at an acute forward angle. The stern was lifting, the bows deep in the water, the stem itself just awash. The ship they had spent so much time and care on, their own compass rose was pointed for her dive, and she would not be poised much longer. He was tormented by what he had not been able to do. It had all happened too quickly, perhaps... Nothing could have saved her. Perhaps she was too vulnerable. Perhaps the odds were too great and he could clear his conscience. He looked once more down the length of the ship. She was quieter already, fatally past the turmoil and the furious endeavour of the first few minutes. He thought momentarily of their position, thirty miles astern of the convoy, and wondered whether any of the stern escorts would have seen Compass Rose catching up on their radar and then noticed that she had faded out and guessed what had happened. That was their only chance on this deadly cold night. He turned and called out, Coxon, pipe abandon ship. He followed Tallow down the ladder and along the steep iron deck, hearing his voice bawling, Abandon ship, abandon ship, ahead of him. There was a crowd of men collected, milling around in the silence, edging towards the high stern. Below them, on the black water, the two Carly floats had been launched and lay in wretched attendance on their peril. Now fear took hold. Some men jumped straight away and struck out from the ship, panting with the cold and calling to their comrades to follow them. Others held back and crowded farther towards the stern on the high side away from the water. The sea began to sprout bobbing red lights as the safety lamps were switched on. The men struck out and away and then crowded together, shouting and calling encouragement to each other, and turned to watch Compass Rose. High out of the water, she seemed to be considering the plunge before she took it. The propeller, bared against the night sky, looked foolish and indecent. The canted mast was like an admonishing finger, bidding them all behave in her absence. She did not delay long thus. She could not. As they watched, the stern rose higher still. The last man left on board, standing on the tip of the after rail, plunged down with a yell of fear. 
There was a rending crash as the whole load of depth charges broke loose from their lashings and ploughed wildly down the length of the upper deck and splashed into the water. There was a muffled explosion which they could each feel like a giant hand squeezing their stomachs and Compass Rose began to slide down. Now she went quickly, as if glad to be quit of her misery. The mast snapped in a ruin of rigging as she fell. When the stern dipped beneath the surface, a tumult of water leapt upwards, then the smell of oil came thick and strong towards them. Their ship was gone. A matter of minutes had wiped out a matter of years. Now, the biting cold, forgotten before the huge disaster of their loss began to return. They were bereaved and left alone in the darkness. Fifty men, two rafts, misery, fear, and the cruel sea. There was not room for them all on the two Kali's. Some sat or lay on them, some gripped the rat lines that hung down from their sides. Some swam around in hopeful circles or clung to other, luckier men who had found a place. The bobbing red lights converged on the rafts. As the men swam, they gasped with fear and cold, and icy waves hit them in the face, and oil went up their nostrils and down their throats. Their hands were quickly numbed, and then their legs, and then the cold probed deep within them, searching for the main blood of their bodies. They thrashed about wildly. They tried to shoulder a place at the rafts and were pushed away again. They swam around and round in the darkness, calling out, cursing their comrades, crying for help, slobbering their prayers. Some of those gripping their rat lines found that they could do so no longer and drifted away. Some of those who had swallowed fuel oil developed a paralyzing cramp and began to retch up what was poisoning them. Some of those who had torn their bodies against the ship's side were attacked by a deadly and congealing chill. Some of those on the rafts grew sleepy as the bitter night progressed, and others lost heart as they peered round them at the black and hopeless darkness, and listened to the sea and the wind and smelt the oil and heard their comrades giving way before this extremity of fear and cold. Presently, men began to die. Some, a few, did not die. Lieutenant Commander Ericsson, Lieutenant Lockhart, leading radar mechanic Sellers, sick berth attendant Crowther, sub-Lieutenant Ferriby, petty officer Phillips, leading Stoker Gracie, Stoker Gray, Stoker Spurway, telegraphist Widows, ordinary seaman Tewson. Eleven men on the two rafts. No others were left alive by morning. At one stage, it had been almost a manageable affair. The two Carlies, with their load of a dozen men each and their cluster of hangers-on, had paddled towards each other across the oily, heaving sea, and Lockhart had taken some kind of rough roll-call, then found that there were over thirty men still alive. But as the long, endless night progressed, men slipped out of life without warning shivering and freezing to death almost between sentences. The strict account of dead and living got out of hand, lost its authority and became meaningless. Indeed, the score was hardly worth the keeping when, within a little while, unless the night ended and the sun came up to warm them, it might add up to total disaster. At one point during the night, the thin crescent moon came through the ragged clouds and illuminated for a few moments the desperate scene below. It shone on a waste of water, growing choppy with the biting wind. It shone on the silhouettes of men hunched together on the rafts, and the shadows of men clinging to them, and the blurred outlines of men in the outer ring, where the corpses wallowed and heaved, and the red lights burned, and burned aimlessly on the breasts of those who hours before, had switched them on in hope and confidence. For a few minutes, the moon put this cold sheen upon the face of the water and upon the foreheads of the men whose heads were still upright. And then it withdrew, veiling itself abruptly as if, in pity and amazement, it had seen enough 
and knew that men in this extremity deserved only the decent mercy of darkness. Lockhart did not die, though many times during that night there seemed to him little reason why this should be so. He had spent most of the dark hours in the water alongside number two Kali, of which he was in charge. Only towards morning, when there was room and to spare, did he climb onto it. From this slightly higher vantage point, he looked round him and felt the coal and smelt the oil and saw the other raft nearby and the troubled water in between. And he pondered the dark shadows which were dead men and the clouds racing across the sky and the single star overhead and the sound of bitter wind. And then, with all this to daunt him and drain him of hope, he took a last grip on himself and on the handful of men on the raft and set himself to stay alive till daylight and to take them along with him. He made them sing. He made them move their arms and legs. He made them talk. He made them keep awake. He slapped their faces. He kicked them. He rocked the raft till they were forced to rouse themselves and cling on. The men on his raft loathed him and the sound of his voice, and his appalling optimism. They cursed him openly, and he answered them back in the same language, and promised them a liberal dose of detention as soon as they got back to harbour. Ericsson, like Lockhart, had realised that sleep had to be fought continuously and relentlessly if anyone to be left alive in the morning. He had therefore spent the greater part of the night putting the men on his raft through an examination for their next higher rating, He'd made a round game of it, half serious, half childish. He asked each man upwards of thirty questions. If the answers were correct, all the others had to clap. If not, they had to boo at the tops of their voices, and the culprit had to perform some vigorous kind of forfeit. His authority carried many of the men along for several hours. It was only toward dawn, when he felt his own brain lagging with the effort of concentration, but the competitors began to thin out, and the clapping and shouting to fade to a moaning like the wind, and a rustling like the cold waves curling and slopping against the raft, the waves that waited to swallow them all. When the first grey light from the eastward began to creep across the water, he roused himself and his men and set them to paddle towards the other raft, which had drifted a full mile away. The light, gaining in strength, seeped round them as if borne by the bitter wind itself, and fell without pity upon the terrible pale sea and the great streaks of oil and the floating bundles that had been living men. As the two rafts drew together, the figures on them waved to each other, jerkily, like people who could scarcely believe that they were not alone. The two rafts were much alike. On each of them was the same handful of filthy, oil-soaked men who still sat upright, while other men lay still in their arms or sprawled at their feet. Round them in the water were the same attendant figures, a horrifying fringe of bobbing corpses, with their meaningless faces blank to the sky and their hands frozen to the ratlines. Between the dead and the living was no sharp dividing line. The men upright on the raft seemed to blur with the dead men they nursed, and with the derelict men in the water, as part of the same vague and pitiful design. Ericsson counted the figures still alive on the other Kali. There were four of them, and Lockhart and Therabee. So the whole total was eleven. He rubbed his hand across his frozen lips and cleared his throat and said, Well, number one. Well, sir. Lockhart stared back at Ericsson for a moment and then looked away. There could be nothing more, nothing to ease the unbearable moment. The wind blew chill in their faces. The water slopped and broke in small, ice-cold waves against the rafts. The harnessed fringe of dead men swayed like dancers. All round them, on the oily, fouled surface, the wretched flotsam, all that was left of Compass Rose, hurt and shamed the eye. 
The picture of the year, thought Lockhart. Morning with corpses. So vipers found them. Throughout the next two years, the transatlantic convoys went on unceasingly. But by 1945, they began to be more like the convoys at the very beginning of the war. Ships and men occasionally ran into trouble, but they were always other ships, other men, strangers who had had bad luck, amateurs who had probably made some silly mistake. For the most part, the U-boats held off for a variety of reasons which could only be guessed at. It might be fear, it might be insufficient numbers, reorganization, the saving of strength for some huge final effort. Whatever it was, the spring of 1945 gave them what all springs should give. Ease, hope and promise in abundant measure. For Ericsson, it was a lull that he needed. He and HMS Saltash, his new command. One could perhaps divine more of the past history of strain from looking at Saltash than from looking at Ericsson, but that did not mean that Ericsson was not feeling it just as strongly. His men had become used to his grey hair, his gruff manner, his stern face with an equal indifference upon a sinking ship, a dead man, a defaulter with a foolish excuse, a pretty visitor to the wardroom. This mask hid his tiredness. Saltash had no such camouflage. She had now been running for over two years, hard-driven years with little respite from the weather or the enemy. She was battered, salt-streaked, dented here and there, a typical Western Approaches escort, telling her whole story at a single glance. Ericsson, surveying his ship as he put off in the motorboat, sometimes found himself wondering what Compass Rose would have looked like if she had still been alive and afloat. It was his fiftieth year, and he looked and felt every hour of it. But thank God for being alive on a fine spring morning when he had never really expected to be, and when lots of people, who for five years had been trying to kill him, were dead themselves. Now, in truth, nothing was happening, and nothing was just what they had been aiming at all along. And so, all over the Atlantic, the fighting died. A strangely tame finish after five and a half years of bitter struggle. But no anticlimax, no quiet end could obscure the triumph and the pride inherent in this victory, with its huge cost. 30,000 seamen killed, 3,000 ships sent to the bottom in this one ocean, and its huge toll of 780 U-boats sunk to even the balance. It would live in history because of its length and its unremitting ferocity. It would live in men's minds for what it did to themselves and to their friends and to the ships they often loved. Above all, it would live in naval tradition and become legend. Though the rest of the upper deck had long been deserted, Lockhart was not surprised to find Ericsson up on the bridge. He might have guessed where the captain would be at this closing hour. Ericsson turned when he heard his step and said, Hello, number one, as if he too were unsurprised. They stood side by side in the cold darkness, saying nothing for a space, sharing the moment of relaxation and the grateful calm around them. It was still early evening, but by now it was almost dark. The moon was already entangled in the rigging, and one by one the shore lights were coming on, the stars of peace, the first light since the beginning of the war. Lockhart knew why they were standing there together, leaning against the side of the bridge under the frosty, open sky, though he was not sure that the moment could be adequately honoured. They were there because it was the last day of the war they had shared. The Atlantic battle was done with, and secretly they wanted to review it, even if it were by vague illusion only, even if no word were spoken. Five years it's taken, said Ericsson suddenly, getting on for six. 
I wonder how far we've steamed. I added it up for Compass Rose, said Lockhart, grateful for the lead. 98,000 miles. But I never did it for salt ash. It seemed unlucky. The noises of the ship rose vaguely to them. Somewhere a small wave curled and broke against their hull. I wish some of the others could have seen this, said Lockhart presently. John Moreau, Therabee. Erickson nodded. Yes, they deserved it. Lockhart, drawing some lost names from the shadows of his mind, murmured aloud, Tallow, Watts, Wells. Who was Wells? asked Erickson. The yeoman in Compass Rose. Oh, yes. He used to say to his signalman, If you get worried, just sing out and I'll be up straight away. This is the time that you miss them. Hmm. But perhaps there are really too many people to remember them properly. The names are just labels in the end. Young, Baker, Rose, Tunbridge, Carslake. You didn't get any medals, said Erickson, inconsequentially. But I did my best for you. Buckhart smiled in the darkness. I can bear it. You deserved something, number one. Erickson sighed. And we only sank three U-boats. Three in five years. We worked hard enough for them, God knows. Yes. Erickson brooded, leaning heavily against a corner of the bridge where he must have spent many hundreds of hours. Out of the deep dusk, he said, and after sixty-eight months it was still a shock to hear him use the words, I must say, I'm damn tired.